Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you an hour, a full 60 minutes of suspense. Tonight, Crossfire. Our stars, Robert Young, Robert Mitchum, Robert Ryan, and Sam Levine, with George Cooper and William Phipps, all playing their original roles from the current RKO radio picture in an adaptation for suspense, produced and directed by Anton M. Leader. Crossfire. Robert Young stars as Captain Finley, Robert Mitchum is Keeley, Robert Ryan is Monty, Sam Levine is Samuels, and Marlo Dwyer is Ginny. With these performances and with Crossfire, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! My name is Finley, Captain of Detectives, Homicide, Washington, D.C. I was the cop on the case. The call came in at 9.45, a girl. I told her to stay there, and we went up. It was an apartment on E Street, the third floor, number 307. The girl was still there and let us in. The place didn't look too bad, considering. There was a chair knocked over and a lamp, and a little liquor slopped around, but aside from that, not bad. Except there was a man lying in the middle of the floor. A man named Joseph Samuels, and he was dead. Beaten to death. No, no, no. Take it easy, Miss Lewis. I'm all right. Was uh, Samuels drunk when you left him in this bar, Miss Lewis? No. Had he been drinking? Yes, but he was all right. What was he arguing with the soldier about? Oh, they weren't arguing. They were just talking. I sent Sammy over to talk to the soldier myself. The kid seems so upset about something. Here's a man's wallet, Captain. Found it behind the cushions on the sofa. Yeah, well, let's have it. Corporal Arthur Mitchell. Uh, what uh, rank was the soldier, Miss Lewis? Oh, I didn't notice. I, I left them. Where did you go? I went up to my room. It was the bar in my hotel. Mm -hmm. I had a change, so I told Sammy I'd meet him here in his apartment. We had a date for dinner. I rested a while, and then I fell asleep. When I woke up, I phoned the apartment to say I'd be a little late, but there wasn't any answer. I came over as soon as I could find a cab. Then I called you. Do, do I have to stay here any longer? No, I'll get somebody to drive you home. O'Hara. Yes? Uh, take Miss Lewis home and check in the bar at her hotel. I will do. Come on, Miss Lewis. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, take this wallet to the Provo Marshal's office and see if they can locate this man. Uh, sure. Well, what do you want? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I must have the wrong place. What uh, place are you looking for? Well, I thought it was this apartment. I, I was looking for a buddy of mine. You're uh, cops? Yeah, we're cops. Well, has something happened? Tell us about your buddy. Yes, sir. Well, we was here. He, he left before we did. He wasn't feeling good. He said he'd be right back. We Who up. was we? Me and, and another buddy of mine. Who did you come here with? With these two buddies of mine and this fellow. What fellow? This fellow we met in a bar. And Miss Lewis? Yes. Soldier, do you recognize this young lady? Come on, did you see this young lady in the bar? Yes, sir. Miss Lewis, is this the man who was with Samuels when you left? No, it, it was another. What's it all about? Come in, soldier, and give a look. Jeez, that's tough. Yeah, isn't it? Somebody killed him. Could you identify him? Same fellow you met in the bar? Yeah, that's, that's him. What's your name? Uh, Montgomery, sir. Were you drunk tonight? Well, I, I had a couple, but I can handle that. I see. How uh, long have you been out of the service? Uh, two weeks, about. Live here? No, sir. What are you doing in Washington? I just came back to see some of my buddies. Where are you staying? At the uh, Stewart Hotel. That's where I used to be stationed. I'm, uh, I'm sponging a free bunk from one of my buddies. What's... Uh, your buddy's name, this one who was sick, the one who was coming back. Mitchell. Mitch, we call him. Mm, O'Hara, hand me that wallet. Here you are, sir. Corporal Arthur Mitchell. Yeah, that's him. Ever see this wallet, soldier? Uh, where did you find it? 
in the sofa. Uh, it must have dropped out of his pocket, but uh, believe me, Mitch couldn't. What's his outfit? Uh, same as mine was. What were you in? Signal Corps Detachment. Stewart Hotel. Mm -hmm. Well, Harold, let's clean it up. Get the coroner up here and give me a full report. Okay, boss. Let's go, Montgomery. Sure, but uh, where are we going? To headquarters. <laughs> See what I mean? Routine, just routine. I put a man on to finding this Mitchell, the one who belonged to the wallet, and I talked some more to Montgomery. Nothing. The cooperative type, but uh, nothing. Pretty soon my man came back. He couldn't find Mitchell, but he had his roommate, a guy named Keeley, the uh, uncooperative type. There he is, Captain. Oh, thanks. You uh, Keeley, Sergeant Keeley? Yeah, I'm Keeley. I'm sorry to break up your Saturday night game, Sergeant. You want to see me about something, Captain? Yes, I want to see you about Mitchell. What about Mitchell? About Mitchell killing a guy. Killing a guy? You know Mitchell, don't you? Yeah, but who's he supposed to have killed? Sit down, Sergeant. We'll Thanks. talk about it. When uh, did you see Mitchell last? This afternoon, 2 o'clock. Where was he going? Crawling. Where? Nowhere. Soldiers don't have anywhere to go unless you tell them where to go. When they're off duty, they go crawling. Or they go crazy. What uh, did you do before you got in the Army? What's that got to do with it? <laughs> it might help me understand your answers. I worked on newspapers. Oh. What uh, sort of a job are you doing now? Ink job. Purple ink. Instead of the Purple Heart, we get Purple Ink. Mitchell, too? Uh, he's an artist. He, he used to do cows eating grass. He's branched out now. He does signs. Keep this washroom clean. If you think he killed anybody, you're crazy. Why? He's not the type. Everybody's the type. He couldn't kill anybody. Could you? I have. Where? Where you get medals for it. <laughs> I see. This uh, Mitchell boy couldn't do that either? No. Uh, tell me about this afternoon when uh, Mitchell left. There wasn't anything to tell. He left. What did you talk to Mrs. Mitchell about? Why, I just... Yeah, here it is. Here, what is? Uh, according to the hotel charge slip, you called Chicago at 2.30 and talked to Mrs. Mitchell. His mother? His wife. It was personal. It wouldn't interest you. What did you call Mrs. Mitchell about? She called me first last week. She was worried about him. He hadn't written. Why? I don't know. Then guess. He's homesick. His wife's sick. I don't know. Anyway, he's got snakes. He's been nuts, but not nuts enough to kill anybody. How was he this afternoon? Oh, he was trying to act like a soldier. I think he went out to look for a girl. What's your name, anyway? Finley. Look, Finley, this sort of life doesn't bother some soldiers. I haven't seen my wife for two years. When I do, maybe we'll pick right up again. Maybe we won't. But I don't worry about it now. Mitchell's not like that. He's, he's not tough. He needs his wife. I called her this afternoon and told her to hop a plane and come cheer him up. Here's her wire. She's on her way. She'll be here tonight. That's good. Still don't know what this is all about. Why'd you pick me up? You're Mitchell's closest friend, aren't you? I don't advertise it. Well, Mitchell's other friend told us about you. His other friend? Who's that? Hello. Oh, Harold, let's have Montgomery back. Right away. Where does Montgomery come in? He was with Mitchell and a boy named Floyd Bowers this afternoon in a bar. They met a Mr. Samuels there and went up to his apartment. Mitchell left first, but he told Montgomery he'd be back. We were looking at Samuels' body when Montgomery came back looking for Mitchell. You're uh, taking Monty's word for all this? Not entirely. Did you ever see this? That's M Mitch's wallet. How'd you get it? We found it in Samuel's apartment, down behind the sofa cushions. Where's Bowers? Did you ask Monty? Ask him yourself. Hiya, Keeley. Did you hear all this? They're trying to pin on Mitch. Part of it. Well, this is serious. They're crucifying the kid. You know Mitch. He won't have a chance. What do you mean by that? Well, Captain, I, I just mean it. Mitchell's not the kind of guy who knows the scoop on things like this. He's a, an artist. He's sensitive. Then you know all about things like this. Well, sure, like I told you. I've been a cop myself in St. Louis. Four years in the jungle on the east side, I know the score. Well, then you can understand my problem, why I need your help. I'm not helping anybody stick my pal in trouble. I'm not asking you to. I'm just asking for facts. How did all this get started in the bar with uh, Samuels? Well, like always bunch of people in a bar. Something happens, and first thing you know, you're talking to somebody. What happened? 
Leroy knocked a drink all over this... Uh, what'd you say her name was? This Miss Lewis. You uh, didn't tell me about Leroy. Oh, he's, he's just a dumb hillbilly. He's a friend of Floyd's. He came in with Floyd, but he didn't stay long. Well, go on. Tell me about it. Well, like I said, we was talking. Me and Floyd and Mitch. Only Mitch was getting high and clamming up. I was worried about Mitch. <clears throat> What's eating you, Mitch? Nothing's eating me. Come on, man, let's go. Sit still, Floyd. You don't get to meet people going in and out of one bar after another. Hey, look out. Leroy, that tray. Oh, oh. oh my dress. I'm sorry, lady. I, I didn't mean to spill. You silly hillbilly. Why don't you watch what you're doing? That's all right. It was an accident. A lady with you? Yeah. I'm sure sorry about my buddy. Oh, that's all right. Here, honey, here. Here's a nap. Waiter, give me that towel. Here, miss. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. You'll have to forgive Leroy here. Leroy's from Tennessee. He just started wearing shoes. Apologize to the lady, Leroy. I said I'm sorry. It was just an accident, soldier. Leroy's all right. He's just dumb. We won the war with him by by not letting him go across. The Krauts had caught him and... Hey, Leroy, where you going? I'll see you, Floyd. Well, now, look there. I heard Leroy's feelings. I'd better change. I'll meet you up at your place, Sammy. Sure, sure. Take your time. Hey, soldier. Yeah? Buy a drink? Sure, why Let's not? here and sit down. Well, Captain, this Samuels and Mitch went off to the other end of the bar, and me and Floyd was just sitting there talking. I don't know how long. This Floyd can really talk when he gets started. <clears throat> man, what I couldn't do with a thousand bucks. What would you do with a thousand bucks? I man, with a thousand bucks, I'd go to Mexico. I'd fish and live on the beach and eat and just Mexico. live on that beach. I've been to Mexico. Them guys down there would have your thousand bucks before you was there a week. Yeah, not my thousand bucks, they wouldn't. I'd steal me an air-cooled machine gun and hey, I'd hey, just... Hey, Floyd, Floyd, look, they're leaving. Who? Mitch and his pal. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Oh, why do we have to go? If the Jew boy is setting up the drink someplace. Who? The Jew boy. The Jew boy. <laughs> Well, Captain, we, we followed them to Sammy's place and just walked in. We all had a couple of drinks. Next thing I knew, Mitch was getting a little green, and pretty soon he left. Floyd was getting kind of stinko, too. So after a while, I got him out of there and started walking him back to the Stewart Hotel. But then I got worried about Mitch. So I, I put Floyd in a cab and went back to look some more for Mitch. And that's when I met you, Captain. And you came up to Samuel's apartment even though you... Saw the police cars outside? Well, how'd I know they had anything to do with Samuels? You're just a bunch of hick cops down here anyway. You'll never pin anything on Mitch. Not in a hundred years. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm just worried sick about Mitch. Did uh, you have any sort of an argument with Samuels? Well, what was there to argue about? Well, what was there to argue about? Liquor was good. Everything was okay. Had you ever seen him before? No, I told you. I just met him in the bar. I never seen him before. You're sure? Sure, I'm sure. Of course, uh, I've seen a lot of guys like him. Meaning what? Oh, you know. Guys that played it safe during the war. Scrounged around, keeping themselves in civvies. They got swell apartments, swell dames. You know the kind. No, I'm not sure that I do. Just what kind? You know. Some of them are named Samuels. Some of them got funnier names. You'll uh, be at the Stewart? Sure, I got nowhere else to go. I'm, I'm just sponging a bunk from one of the boys. You coming, Keeley? There are one or two more questions I want to ask Sergeant Keeley. Well, so long, Captain. If there's anything else, just call on me. You should look at a casualty list sometime. There are a lot of funny names there, too. Hmm? I said Monty's illiterate. I said... He ought to read more. I was just philosophizing. I'm not interested in philosophy. I'm trying to solve a murder. Pardon me. Mitchell was in a strange mood tonight. You admit that. Uh -huh. He left Samuel's apartment intending to come back. We arrive and find Samuel's beaten to death. We find Mitchell's wallet and the sofa. I say Mitchell did come back. Some sort of an argument developed. I say nuts. Why? Or don't you think Mitchell would kill Samuel's that way? I don't think Mitchell would kill anybody anyway. You still don't know where he is. No, I don't. I didn't know when I came in here, and I haven't suddenly gotten any brighter. You don't believe he did it yourself. He could have. He was there. So were Monty and Floyd. 
But they left. Mitchell said he was coming back. According to Monty. According to Monty. Monty's a liar. What makes you believe his story? It just happens to be the only story I've got. Then why did you let him go? Did I? You don't really think he'll lead you to Floyd Bowers, do you? I don't know. Is that all for me? Yeah, I guess so for now. Okay. You know where to find me. I'm Keeley. You've heard from me already. I was Mitch's friend. And brother, when I walked out of that smart cop's office, I knew if I didn't find him before the fuzz nabbed him, he was a dead pigeon. When I got back to the hotel, the lobby was so full of cops and MPs, they were dancing with each other. So I rounded up a couple of my scouts, told them Mitch was up to his ears in trouble, and I, I stationed them around the lobby to keep, out on, keep an eye out for him. I also told them to keep on the lookout for Floyd Bowers. He might know something. And I waited at the counter of the coffee shop where I could see the street from the window. Sure enough, about half an hour, I saw Mitch cutting across the street for the hotel entrance. I managed to get outside and put the snatch on him before the cops knew what I was up to, and ten minutes later, we were sitting in the balcony of an all-night movie house with nobody around but a few drunks and bums. And I gave him the pitch. Keeley, I couldn't have killed him. But that's him. not the point. You've got to have a story for the cops. They've got Monty's, and it sounds pretty, but not for you. I want you to tell me everything you did tonight. How drunk were you? I don't know. Pretty drunk, I guess. How long were you with this girl? Well, I oh, think... Oh, you ought to know. Was it one hour, two hours, three hours? I can't remember. My head hurts. I can't remember anything very well. So it hurts. You've got to remember. You ran into Monty and Leroy and Floyd, didn't you? Yes. And you went in a bar with them? That's right. Okay, now take it from the bar. Take it slow and remember everything you can. Well, we were there quite a while, I guess. I got restless and I wanted to shove. I was sick of money and I was sick of Floyd. I wanted to be somewhere else. So I drifted off to the other end of the bar and his fellow Samuels came over and he sat next to me and began to talk. First, I didn't pay much attention. I was feeling so low myself. My girl is worried about you. She says you're not drinking, but you're getting drunk anyway. Anybody who can do that has got a problem. So what? It's a funny thing, isn't it, how it gets worse at night? I think maybe it's suddenly not having a lot of enemies to hate anymore. The war is over. And now we don't know what we're supposed to do. We don't know what's supposed to happen. We're too used to fighting. But we don't know just what to fight. Know what I mean? I guess so. You can feel the tension in the air right here in this bar. A lot of fight and hate that doesn't know where to go. A guy like you may start hating himself. Ah, one of these days, maybe we'll all stop hating and start liking things again, huh? What sort of an artist are you? I did a mural once for the WPA. Oh, a lot of fine artists came from there. I saw one that was... He seemed like a nice fellow, this Samuels. A real nice fellow. I think he must have been on a newspaper or something. We talked a while, then we decided to go up to his place. He was going to meet his girl there. Monty and Floyd must have followed us because after we got to the apartment, they walked in. I guess I must have been getting pretty tight because I don't remember exactly what we talked about up there or how long it was before Monty and Floyd came. All I remember is that the radio was on playing some nice music. Debussy, I think. And Monty was yammering away <laughs> doing most of the talking. You're doing all right, Floyd. You're doing all right, Mitch, kid. Sammy, let me tell you something. Not many civilians will take a soldier into his house like this for a quiet talk. Is that right, Floyd? That's right, Monty. Well, let me tell you something. A guy's afraid to take a soldier into his house, he stinks. He ought to have the screws put to him. Am I right or am I right? Sergeant, don't you think I asked you, you a question, Sammy. What was that? You know what was that. Am I right or am I right? You're right, Sergeant. You can say that again. You're all right, Sammy boy. You're okay. Mitch, are you all right? I'm all right. I just need a little air. Can I get you anything? No, I, I'm all right. I'll be right back. 
I'm all right. He's all right. You heard him say he's all right. Let's have another round. I'm afraid there isn't time, Sergeant. What I have kind to... of a brush is this? What's the matter, Jew boy? Afraid we'll drink up all your food? You know how I am, Keeley. I hate to hear anybody yelling at anybody. So I decided not to go back when I got out. The air felt good. I must have started to walk. I don't remember how far or what direction. But the next thing I knew, I was in a joint called the Red Dragon. I was talking to this girl named Jenny and, and buying her drinks. Do I have to tell you my name again? Well, well, it's Jenny, because I'm from Virginia. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, this joint stinks. I sure get tired of it here. What do you work here for, then? For laughs, dear, for laughs. Every night? Every night. <laughs> Come on, up with your glass. Here's to nothing. You work here and until when? Until we close. Then what? <laughs> then I sleep. Me and myself in my great big bed we sleep. <laughs> you know, I could have killed my roommate the other morning. She was you making... You got that in quick, didn't you? Huh? Drink up and be nice. You know what I'd like to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I no. know. I'd like to take you dancing. Well, that's what that music's for. I work here. I mean, really take you dancing. The two of us going somewhere, eating something, talking about ourselves. <laughs> You're a character. I'm serious. Sure, sure, I know. I remind you of your sister. You remind me of my wife. Look, look, be nice. Order some more drinks, Th then we'll dance. I've had enough to drink. Well, toodaloo. Wait, Jenny, don't go. I've got some things to do. I was looking all over for you, Jenny. What did you leave for? Well, you didn't want to drink. All you wanted to do was yap. I don't make money on that. You're not getting so rich out here in the terrace all by yourself. Well... Well, it's nicer out here on the terrace all by myself. What's wrong with me, anyway? You're corny. Well, what did I say? We were just talking. <laughs> Is that what that was? You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to take you dancing. You remind me of my wife. What's the idea of saying a thing like that? Oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to insult you. <laughs> you know something? I haven't really been dancing for, for almost two years. Why not? Because I haven't. Why? Because I've been working for a living. What do you do when you're not working for a living? I live. How much would you charge to dance with me here? <laughs> a lot. Mm -hmm. Gee, you're a smooth dancer, Jenny. <laughs> you're not so bad yourself. It's nice out here. Yeah, yeah, you know, this used to be a spaghetti restaurant with tables out here. They don't use the terrace anymore. Say, say, say how would you like me to make you some spaghetti? You mean here? <laughs> oh, no, silly. Look, I, I live at the Regal Apartments on Southern Street. You could wait for me. Well, I, I won't be there for a couple of hours, but well, you could sleep or something. <laughs> Here's the key. Jenny, will you let me kiss you? Oh, you're nice. Look, I, I, I'll try to get away early, but, but if you don't want to wait for me, you can just lock the door and put the key in the mailbox. I'll wait. I guess it was a crazy thing to do, Keeley, but it made sense at the time. Besides, I thought I could use a little shut-eye. So I walked around some more, and then I went up to Jenny's apartment. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I remember, somebody was knocking on the door. How about some light? Uh, sure. Can't she come home yet? I don't know. I don't think so. You mean Jenny, don't you? What do you mean? I guess I mean Jenny. Do you belong here or something? Or something. How long you been waiting? I don't know. Oh, that's great. Have a cigarette? Thanks. I just woke up. I don't even know what time it is. I, I've got a key here somewhere she gave I it. know. I saw you with her at the joint. Oh? Who are you? I'm a man who's waiting for her. Is that all right? Sure. Want some coffee? Sure. I'm a husband. I'm Jenny's husband. Are you? 
I was a soldier too, but I conked up. Guess you're wondering about this setup, aren't you? I guess I am. Well, ask her about it then. She was a tramp when I married her. I didn't know it at first, but I knew it before we were married. It's one of the reasons I enlisted, to, to get away from her. But I couldn't wait to get out and come back to her. When I did, she didn't want me. <laughs> Funny, ain't it? But I still want her. I still love her. How, how, how's that coffee doing? I'll be ready in a minute. You know what I just told you? Well, it's a lie. I see. I'm not her husband. I met her the same as you did, the jerk. I can't keep away from her. I want to marry her. She won't have me. I see. You believe that? Well, that's a lie, too. I don't love her. I don't want to marry her. She makes good money there. Got any money on you? While this screwball goes on with his double talk, I suddenly remember you, Keeley, about having to meet you at the hotel at midnight. So I decided to get out of there. I went straight back to the hotel, and the next thing I knew, you were pushing me around and hauling me off to this joint. Listen, I don't like all-night movie houses any more than you do, but you're in a jam. Now, how long was it from the time you left Samuels till the time you met this Jenny? I don't know. That's a help. How long are we in our apartment altogether? Well, I think... Mm -hmm. You ought to be kept in a cage. Keeley, what's happened? Is everything suddenly crazy? I don't mean this. I mean everything. Or is it just me? No, it's not just you. The snakes are loose. Anybody can get them. I got them. But they're friends of mine. I think Samuels understood it. Yeah, maybe he did it that. You still in love with your wife? I guess I am. She's still in love with you? That's a screwy thing to ask. Well, maybe it is, but she's here now, as she should be. I've got to figure out how much of this to tell her. Mary? Here? Oh, well, what's she... don't worry. She doesn't know anything yet. She was coming anyway. Why? To see you. I talked to her this afternoon. Maybe she's here now. She was supposed to be on a plane. Well, you sit tight. I'll go see if I can find her. Keeley, I couldn't have killed this guy, could hey. I? Hey, there's Leroy. I wonder what he wants. Keeley, listen, I found Floyd. Floyd? Where? In a room in a place down on Maryland Street where he's hiding out. He just phoned me and tried to raise some dough for something. He sounded awful scared. You got the address? I don't want to have nothing to do with this. I shouldn't have told you. I don't want to get in any trouble, Keeley. You won't get in trouble. All you have to do is tell us where Floyd is. Then you can go back to the hotel and stay there and forget it. And you, Mitch, you just keep right on watching the picture and don't move. Don't even move to another seat. You want Leroy to bring you a sandwich or something? No. But, Keeley, where are you going? I'm going to see Floyd Bowers. I didn't have any trouble finding Floyd. He was just where Leroy said he was. Crummy little room on the second floor. And he was scared, scared to death. And wanting to get rid of me the worst way. Why? I didn't know then. I talked to him for quite a while, but I couldn't get a thing out of him. Well, I didn't have all night to waste either, so after 15 or 20 minutes, I got up to leave. Well, uh, thanks for dropping around, Keeley. It's okay. You, uh, you sure you haven't got anything on your mind? No, no. Not a thing, Keeley. Well, I'll be seeing you. Sure. Yeah, sure. So long, Keeley. Night, Floyd. I went on out and down the stairs. I couldn't figure it out. Of course I couldn't. Because what I didn't know was that all the time I'd been in that room, Monty had been there too. After I left, he was still there. It's okay, Monty. He's gone now. I know he's gone. Monty, I didn't call Keeley up here. No? <gasps> oh, Monty, don't! I told you not to go out anywhere, Floyd. You went out, Floyd. You didn't do like I said. <laughs> you went out and got in touch with Keeley. You shouldn't have done that. No, I didn't, Monty. I didn't get in touch with Keeley. I called Leroy. Leroy must have told him. Try money, Monty. All I did was try to get some dough. Now, look, you got plenty of dough, Monty. Give me some dough. I had everything figured out. Just what we was going to do. I told you to stay here. You went out and phoned. You spoiled <laughs> everything. I didn't, Monty. I didn't spoil nothing. I told Keeley I hadn't seen you. You heard me say that. Nobody can pin anything on you. That's right, Floyd. Nobody can pin anything on me. Oh, now, look, Monty. I'll go to Mexico. I'll never come back. I didn't have nothing to do with it. I, I don't want to get mixed up in it, Monty. 
criminy, Monty. You went crazy or something. Samuels didn't do nothing to you. You, you went crazy. I didn't do nothing to Samuels either. Except I flicked it <gasps> like that. Not that hard, maybe. More like that. <gasps> or that. Or that. Not hard enough to hurt anybody. <laughs> stop it, Monty! Monty, stop it, you went nuts! I forget nothing against any Jews. I just don't like Jews. And I don't like nobody who likes you. In tonight's full hour of suspense, our stars are Robert Young as Captain Findlay, Robert Mitchum, Robert Ryan, and Sam Levine in Crossfire. Tonight's study in Suspense. In just a moment, we will return with Act Two of Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, back to our Hollywood soundstage and Act Two of Crossfire. Starring Robert Young, Robert Mitchum, Robert Ryan, and Sam Levine, with George Cooper, William Phipps, and Marlo Dwyer, in a narrative well calculated to keep you in suspense. said before, I'm just a cop. And by this time, I was a tired cop, dog tired. I'd been doing a lot of work for the last six hours, most of it leading nowhere, because still no Mitchell. But by this time, I had Mrs. Mitchell right in my office. And figuring maybe she might be anxious to see her husband, too, I asked O'Hara to locate that helpful character, Keeley. Okay. And bring him in. Right. Why, here's Sergeant Keeley, Captain. Come on in, Sergeant. Captain Finley was just sending me out to find you. I've been waiting to see him. Hello, Keeley. Mary, what are you doing here? We picked up Mrs. Mitchell at the airport. Oh, well, what do you want me for? Floyd Bowers is dead, Sergeant. Dead? He was alive a couple of hours ago. I just saw him. Well, when I saw him about 20 minutes ago, he was good and dead, strung up by the necktie. I just came here, Captain, to tell you I'd talk to Floyd. If you'd come here right away, Sergeant, as soon as you found out where Floyd was, I could have talked to him myself, and he'd still be alive. You win, Captain. Now, don't you think you'd better tell me where Mitchell is, Sergeant? Why? I don't want anybody else killed if I can help it. You might as well work with me now if you really want to help Mitchell, because you're in custody, in case you didn't know it. I'll listen to anything constructive you have to say, but I won't stand for any more interference. You've got a mind like a dog catcher. Okay, I'm in custody. Everybody's in custody. What does that prove? Except that you've got a big jail. If you want Mitchell so bad, you can go out and find him. All right, I was just hoping there was an easier way. I talked to Mitchell a little while ago. Where is he? I said I talked to Mitchell, Captain. He couldn't have killed Samuels. He didn't go back to Samuels' apartment after he went out for some air. He went straight to a... He went straight to a joint where he met a girl. Oh, Keely. Take it easy, Mary. Mitch was in this girl's apartment for the next couple of hours. What does that prove? It proves he went to a joint and he met a girl. What, a man who's just killed somebody do a thing like that? I'm sorry, Mary. And it proves where he was for two hours. Which two hours? He doesn't remember. But all you have to do is ask the girl. Who is she? She's a girl. She calls herself Ginny. Mitch knows where she lives. When did he tell you all of this? Just before I went to see Floyd. Did he know where you were going? Yeah. Then he could have killed Floyd himself. He didn't know the address. He could have followed you. Captain Finley, if... If Keeley tells you where Mitch is, will you let him go? And, and will you promise to let me see Mitch first, by myself? No, I won't let Keeley go. But I'll let you talk to your husband alone. I'll be waiting outside, wherever he is. Please tell him, Keeley. Please. He's in the balcony of an all-night movie, The Regent, about four blocks from the hotel. <laughs> I took Mrs. Mitchell to the Regent Theater and waited downstairs by the popcorn machine while she had her private talk with her husband. I don't know what they said to each other, but it wasn't hard to imagine. A guy and his wife separated for four years and then Socko, this deal. 
But you could tell from the way they looked at each other when they came out that whatever came between them from now on, it wasn't going to be that other girl. I put Mitchell in the squad car with O'Hara, and then Mrs. Mitchell and I went on to pay our call. Mitchell had given his wife the address, Regal Apartment, Southern Street, the name Ginny. Captain Finley. Uh, yes, Mrs. Mitchell. Can I go in and talk to... to Ginny first? I mean, go in alone. Why? Well, she might tell me more than she'd tell you. All right, I see the transom's open. I guess I won't miss anything. What is it? Ginny. Well, who's there? I'm Mrs. Mitchell. Great. How's Mr. Mitchell? My husband Look, is so... Look, what do you want anyway? It's late. I'm sorry. I, I wanted to talk to a girl named Ginny. My husband's a soldier who was here tonight. Well, there aren't any soldiers here now. Just me. I don't have anything to do with soldiers. Sorry. Good night. Please wait, please. I, I've got to talk to you. It's terribly important. I know it's late, but you've got to help me. Can't I come in for, for just a minute? Please. Oh, all right. My husband's in trouble. Look, I don't know anything about your husband. Honest, honest, why don't you go home? Maybe, maybe he's waiting for you. He's in jail. They say he killed a man, but he didn't. Okay, then there isn't any problem. Huh? What do you want from me anyway? A character reference? All I want you to do is to say that he was with you tonight. Tonight's a long time ago. I wouldn't be able to remember. You'd remember Mitch. Why? Does he have two heads or something? You danced with him. <laughs> you danced with him out in back of where you work, in a sort of a, a terrace garden. You gave him your key and, and you told him your address. He told you that he was up here with me tonight? Yes, he... Well, well, he lied to you. If he was here, I didn't know about it. And I don't know where you got my name and address. I can't tell you anything else. You better go now. Hello, Jenny. Who are you? What do you want? I want to talk to you. What's your name? Uh, are you a cop or something? What's your name? I don't like cops. Nobody likes cops. What's your name? Virginia Tremaine. Why? Where are you from? From here? Uh, before you were from here. Pennsylvania. Wilkesbury. So what? What do you do? I work. Where? The Red Dragon. Well, what's wrong about working there? Does that make me a criminal or something? Does that give you the right to bust into my house and start asking a lot of questions? Is that where you met Mitchell at the Red Dragon? That's where I, where I meet a lot of people. I, I never heard of this Mitchell. You uh, live here alone? Sure. Is there something wrong in that? Jenny, Jenny, the police won't hurt you. He promised me. All we want you to do is to tell the truth. Sit down, Virginia. Now, about Mrs. Mitchell's husband. He's in pretty deep, Virginia. Looks like he killed a man, maybe two. Mrs. Mitchell doesn't think he did, of course, but that's only natural. Jenny, don't you see? I know he was here. He told me. But that doesn't matter anymore. Never mind me. You've got to think of him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. Listen to that. Never mind me. You've got to think of him. <laughs> oh, now, isn't that sweet? Isn't that just too sweet. He wasn't here with me, see? He could have been, but he wasn't. He could have come up. I could have cooked him something and we could have talked. And what would have been wrong with that? What's the matter with me being with her precious husband? Does he break or something? Hmm. Where was she? Okay. Where were you when he needed you? Maybe you were someplace having beautiful thoughts. Well, I wasn't. I was in a stinking gin mill where all he had to do to see me was walk in, sit down at a table, and buy me a drink. And that's all I know about it. I, I didn't ask him if he killed anybody. Virginia, listen, you're not involved in this murder, so nothing's going to happen to you. That's the first point. Got it? You bet I got it. Okay, now, when was... I mean, what time? What time was Mitchell with you at the Red Dragon? I don't know. We found the body of this man, this uh, Samuels, about ten... He'd only been dead about a half hour. So if Mitchell was with you from, say, 9 to 10, he's all right. Tell me the truth. No. Oh, no. I, I gave him my key. I, I don't know, maybe maybe 8.30. I, I liked him. I felt sorry for him. Oh, I was sick of the stinking joint. I was going to ditch early, only I couldn't. I, I didn't get home until 1, well, maybe 2. 
He wasn't here. He had been here, and he'd gone. He left the key. But I, I don't know what time. Jenny, is that the truth? I said it's the truth. What do you want me to do? Light up like a Christmas tree? We're wasting our time, Mrs. Mitchell. This isn't going to help your husband. Let's go. <laughs> By the time I got to my office, it was dawn, gray and dirty, which is how I felt, plus disgusted. Mitchell and I were going around in circles. I didn't murder anybody. Why would I murder him? What motive would I have? Maybe you didn't like him. Maybe you hated him. Hate's a good motive. Why would I hate him? I hardly knew him. I only talked to him for a couple of hours. He seemed like a nice guy. You know he was a Jew? No. You mean to say you didn't know he was Jewish? No, I didn't think about it. Well, what would that have to do with it? I got Montgomery for you. Yeah, all right. I'll see him in a minute. I'm uh, through here with Mitchell, but I want to talk to Keeley again. Okay, boy. Uh, that door, Mitchell, over there. Okay. Uh, here are the papers you wanted from the War Department on Samuels. Oh, yeah. Hit on Okinawa. Got a medical discharge last summer. Well, uh, let's give a look. Samuels, Joseph, ASN 392 32880, Army of the United States. Joseph Samuels was discharged 28 August 1945 upon recommendation of a medical board because of disability from wounds received at Okinawa. <laughs> so that's our stinking civilian. All right, O'Hare, let's have money. Okay. Come on in, money. Okay. You want to see me, Captain? I figured it must be important. I, I want to help all I can. Yeah, sit down. So. Yes, sir. Sergeant, uh, how did you know Samuels hadn't been in the Army? Huh? When I talked to you earlier this evening, you were sure that Samuels had never been in uniform. How did you know that? Well, like I said, you could tell. You could see. Those kind of guys got ways of keeping themselves from getting dirty. Uh, why do you ask that, Captain? I was just curious. You know who killed him yet? Yes, I think I do. Was that all, Captain? Didn't you want to ask me something else? No, that's all. I can go now? Yes. Okay, then, Captain. Oh, Montgomery. Uh, yes, sir. You haven't seen anything of this friend of yours, that uh, Floyd Bowers, have you? No, sir, I haven't. I can't figure well, out Well, let me what... know when you do, will you? Yes, sir. So long, sir. Oh, Harris, send Keeley in. You look all in, Keeley. Thanks for the concern. Sunday morning. <sighs> Mrs. Finley is just about leaving for early mass. Now that I know that, can I go back to bed? Well, what's the matter? I thought you were going to have this all solved by now. I'm in a cage. I'm not doing anything except breathing. You've got Mitchell. You've got your little fairy tale all written. Drunk, trouble at home, can't tell a clear story. Open and shut. What's holding you back? Is that all? That's all. All right, then. Do you really want to help me wind this up? I thought you didn't like me. You talk too much sometimes. Well, you're appealing to my better side. Yes. Eh? Making me some sort of a proposition? Yes. Uh, I'd like to sleep on it. You can sleep all day when we're finished. Okay, then. You uh, usually have to know something about a man to have a reason to kill him, don't you, Keeley? Yeah, uh, I guess so. You have to know him well enough to be in love with his wife or well enough to know he has some money. Mm -hmm. Samuels didn't have any money. He didn't even have a wife. So what? So this. None of these men knew that or anything else about Samuels. They hadn't known him well enough or long enough to have an ordinary motive for killing him. Mitchell talked to him for maybe an hour, the others less. So it had to be something else, a motive inside the killer himself. Go on. The killer had to be someone who could hate Samuels without knowing him, who could hate him enough to kill him under the right circumstances, not for any real reason, but mistakenly and ignorantly. You interest me, Captain. Well, once I figured that out, the rest wasn't too hard. I looked around at my suspects. I thought back over the answers I'd had tonight. Some of them fit. I knew who killed Samuels. You booked him? No, not yet. I'm uh, taking the chance that you're smart enough to know what I'm talking you about. You don't have to draw me pictures. I know what you're getting at. I think you're right. 
What do you want me to do? Yes, I have nothing on Montgomery, nothing at all. I might never get anything. I want to take a long chance on nailing him quick. How well do you know him? Well, I've tried to like him, but he's not my type. Does he have many close friends? He had one, Bowers. I think he killed him. So do I. What about that uh, the southern boy, Leroy? No, I don't think so. He was in Monty's platoon. But Just how do you think he feels about Monty? You're getting ahead of me. Well, I was hoping he didn't like Monty. I think he's scared to death of him. Is he really as dumb as Monty says? Well, he's pretty young. He doesn't always know which end is up. Monty doesn't think he's smart enough to lie. What if Leroy told Monty a fantastic story? Would Monty believe him? Yeah, he might. I'll risk it. Huh? Yes, sir? Keeley's on his way out. I don't want to see anything in the papers about Floyd Bowers' killing. Not a word. As far as we know, he's still alive. We've never heard of him. Will do, Chief. Keely, I want you to get Leroy out of the Stewart Hotel without being seen and bring him here. Can you do it? If I have to sandbag him. In an hour on the nose, Keeley was back at headquarters with Leroy. But it wasn't going to be easy. Leroy was suspicious and he was scared. It isn't that I don't want to help, Captain. It's, well, I don't, well, I've never been around with Monty and Floyd much. Monty never wanted me around. He says I'm stupid. I guess I am. Sir, how do you know he really killed him like you say? We don't. That's what we want you to help us prove. Keely, I told you I didn't want to get in any trouble. You're not going to get in any trouble and stop worrying about Monty. Captain Finley won't let anything happen to you. Maybe you're right, sir. But I can't think he'd do a thing like that without no reason. We thought he had a reason. You know the way Monty feels. You've heard the things he says. Well, yes, I... I guess I heard him say a couple of times about Jewish people living off the fat of the land while he was out there. And you say that's all lies. And I guess it is. I don't know, but... Look, maybe Monty roughed this guy up a little, and that was all. That was all he started out to do, yes. He didn't have a plan or anything like that. This, um business of hating Jews comes in a lot of different sizes. There's the you-can't-join-our-country-club kind, and the you-can't-live-around-here kind. Yes, and the you-can't-work-here kind. Because we stand for all of these, we get Monty's kind. He's just one guy. We don't get him very often, but he grows out of all the rest. Look, Leroy, uh, you know we have a law against carrying a gun? Sure. We have that law because a gun is dangerous. Well, hate Monty's kind of hate is like a gun. If you carry it around with you, it can go off and kill somebody. It killed Samuels last night. Monty was in my outfit. It killed Floyd. I hate to think of anything like that happening to Floyd. And I hate to see Monty get away with anything. But look, I'm getting out soon. I might get in trouble. And I don't see this as any of my business anyway. Has uh, Monty ever made fun of your accent? Well, sure, lots of times he... Why? I don't know. He calls you a hillbilly, doesn't he? He says you're dumb. He laughs at you because you're from Tennessee. He's never even been in Tennessee. Ignorant men are afraid of things they don't understand. They end up hating them. You get me all mixed up. How do I know what you're trying to do? How do I know you aren't a Jewish person yourself or something? You don't. But would it make any difference? I guess not. Well, all right, Leroy. But just one more thing, then you can go if you want to. Uh, about a... A hundred years ago in Ireland, the potato crop failed. A lot of Irish immigrants came over here. Their talk was different, like yours, Leroy. They were Catholics, most of them. One of them I knew about stayed in Boston. He thought of himself as just another American until suddenly one day he looked around and saw that something had happened. It frightened him. Fear and hatred of all Irish Catholics had developed and spread like a terrible disease. He saw he wasn't an American anymore. He was a dirty Irish mick. He didn't understand. He didn't know what to do. But one day, when a bunch of men attacked his parish priest on the street, he waded in to help him. That night, on the way home from work, he stopped off for a beer. When he left the bar, two men followed him, carrying empty whiskey bottles. They didn't mean to kill him. They were just going to rough him up a little. They just started out hating, the way Monty started out. 20 minutes later, my grandfather was dead. Your grandfather? That's history, Leroy. They don't teach it in school, but it's real American history, just the same. Thomas Finley was killed in 1848 just because he was an Irishman and a Catholic. And last night, Joseph Samuels was killed just because he was a Jew. 
Do you see any difference, Leroy? Hating is always the same, always senseless. One day it kills Irish Catholics, the next day Jews. It's hard to stop. It can end up killing men who wear striped neckties. Or people from Tennessee. Will you tell me exactly what to say? Yep, I'll tell you exactly what to say. If it would work at all, I knew it would be just the same as if I'd been listening in on them. I already knew what Leroy was going to say, and I thought I'd sized up Montgomery well enough by this time to figure him out, too. Leroy cornered him in the hotel washroom while he was shaving. Hiya, Monty. Hiya. You heard about everything that happened, Monty? Uh-huh. I heard they got Keeley and Mitchell, and they're holding them. I guess it's a good thing I left the bar when I did, or I'd be mixed up in it, too. Floyd didn't have anything to do with it, did he, Monty? Knock it off. What's the matter, Monty? Monty, no kidding. Floyd couldn't have done it, could he? Floyd wouldn't bump anybody off, would he? I don't know. He sure acted funny when I saw him last night. When did you see him? I saw him after. After what? After all that happened. He wants to see you, Monty. He asked me to tell you he wanted to see you. He did? Honest, Monty, I didn't know whether I ought to tell you or not. You don't want to get mixed up in anything any more than you are, but he was acting crazy, Monty. He gave me a crazy thing to tell you. He said, tell Monty the necktie wasn't any good. What do you mean by that, Monty? What was this you saw, Floyd Leroy? How did you happen to see him? He called me and asked me to come over to where he was. Where was he? Some old place down on Maryland Street on the second floor. Let's see, I wrote down the address. What did I do with it? It was on a little piece of paper. It must be in my other pocket. Gosh, Monty, Floyd was really acting crazy. He said you shouldn't come today. He said to come tonight before 10. Well, here it is. 404 Maryland Avenue. That's it. Huh? Will you go see Floyd, Monty? Will you give him some money? I wouldn't say anything about this if I was you, Leroy. Understand? I wouldn't say a word to anyone. It was a long shot, but what else could I do? O'Hara and I went down to the Maryland Avenue place and waited. We'd been waiting about 20 minutes when we heard steps on the stairs. They stopped on the landing, then started shuffling along the hall. They stopped again outside the door. Somebody was fumbling at the doorknob. Then the door opened. It was Montgomery. I, uh, oh. Hello, Montgomery. Well, I, uh, I was looking for Floyd Bower's room. Somebody said he was here. Well, that's too bad, Sergeant. Floyd was here, but he isn't anymore. Well, what's wrong? Has something happened, Captain? Bowers is dead. Dead? Mm-hmm. He was killed today. You know who killed him? Mm-hmm. Not yet. How uh, did you know he was here? When I talked to you last night, you didn't know where he was. Well, I didn't then. I, I didn't know then where he was. A, a fellow back at the hotel, he told me Floyd was here, and Floyd was scared, and he, he wanted to see me about something. I just come. I, I didn't even know which room it was. I was looking for the right room. He was knocked off in this room. Mm Mm-hmm. The same guy who knocked off Samuels, maybe. Well, it could be. I liked Floyd, Captain. I liked Floyd a lot. I naturally came to help him. This this fellow said he needed some dough for something. You should have come right away. Well, uh, this this fellow said... Floyd said not to... uh, Not till tonight. I figured if Floyd said that, he must have got a reason. I see. Well, it looks like somebody was stringing you along. Yeah. What was this fellow's name, the one who told you Floyd wanted to see you? Uh, Look, Captain, I don't want to be a pigeon, this guy. What was his name? Leroy something. He was a friend of Floyd's. Maybe you remember me mentioning him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You uh, never been to this house before? No, no, no. I never been here before. I never even been in this part of town. I didn't know which room it was, except it was on the second floor. Like Leroy said... I was looking for the right door. Seems like you have a lot of trouble with doors, Sergeant. First time we met, you were looking for the right door. That's, that's right, sir. But you knew the address. You knew which house to come to. Sure. Leroy, give me the address. Was it written down on a piece of paper? Yeah. Do you still have this piece of paper? Yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, here it is. Let me see it. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. I'll have to arrest you, Montgomery. Why would you arrest me, Captain? What would you arrest me for? For the murder of Samuels and Bowers. Well, you're kidding, Captain. I never even been here before. Why, I, you didn't I... look at this paper carefully. This is the address of the house next door. I wrote it down myself. You made a mistake, Sergeant. You came to the right house anyway. Gee, Captain. You got this all wrong. Just let me explain. You see? Oh. The next thing I knew, I was on the floor and O'Hara on top of me. Montgomery hit him so hard, he bowled me over like a ten pin. Then O'Hara was up, going down the stairs after him, and I was over at the window in time to see him come out onto the street. I tried to get the window up, but it wouldn't budge. I smashed the glass with the butt of my gun, then I took aim. Montgomery! Stop! Montgomery! That was all. By the time I got down to the street, Montgomery was dead. A crowd was gathering, and right, Keeley was standing there looking right. down at what lay in the street, and right, sort of shaking his head. Break it up now. Break it up. Set back, everybody. Oh, I'm afraid he was a bad boy. Bad? Maybe. Ignorant. Fed with it. Fed to the teeth with it, and the day he was born. Yeah. All right, O'Hara, clean it up. Okay, Captain. How's Mitch? Come on. Uh, with his wife. Want to see him? Oh, I guess not. Can I drop you anywhere? No, thanks. Well, good night, Captain. Good night, Sergeant. And, uh, good luck. sincere thanks to a wonderful cast. To Robert Young, who was Captain Finley, Robert Mitchum in the role of Keeley, Robert Ryan, who played Monty, and to Sam Levine as Samuels. To George Cooper as Mitchell, and William Phipps as Leroy. To Marlo Dwyer as Ginny, Julie Bennett as Mary, Bill Johnstone as O'Hara, Bill Lally as Floyd, and Louis Van Ruten as The Man. Our thanks for your superb performances in this suspense adaptation of Crossfire. Robert Young may currently be seen in Relentless. Robert Mitchum will soon be seen in the RKO radio picture, Rachel and the Stranger. Robert Ryan will soon appear in Berlin Express and George Cooper in Blood on the Moon, both RKO radio productions. Sam Levine's next picture is the Babe Ruth story. Crossfire, based on the original novel, The Brick Foxhole, by Richard Brooks, was adapted for suspense by Robert L. Richards and Henriette Martin, and was produced and directed by Anton M. Leader. Lud Gluskin is our musical director and conductor, and Lucian Marowak composes the original scores for radio's outstanding theater of thrills, one hour of... Suspense! This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. An hour of suspense. A full 60 minutes at this time with the distinguished actor-director, Mr. Robert Montgomery, as your host. Tonight, our star, Mr. John McIntyre. 
Our story, Donovan's Brain. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed William Spear. <laughs> Mr. Montgomery. The man across the table was talking about shaved heads and electricity, and I was listening. I'll have to admit it, I'm pretty much of a layman when it comes to things like that. I imagine you are, too. But the man I was talking with was a specialist. I sought him out after we decided on our suspense play for tonight. As you know, we're doing Donovan's Brain. And the man across the table who discussed shaved heads and electricity with such final authority was an eminent brain surgeon. Now, I don't know very much about the human brain. I have one, and I use it occasionally, I hope. But I leave the clinical knowledge up to the brain specialists, like the man across the table. To this man of science, I pose the momentous question, what about the brain? And he started in. Your brain, he said, is something less than two and a half percent of your total body weight. There's no relation between the weight of your brain and your intelligence. There's no relation between the size of your brain and your intelligence. So we threw out size and weight and talked about what you could tell about a person's intelligence simply by looking at his brain. And it develops, you can tell quite a lot, by looking. An intelligent person's brain is more complex in appearance than a stupid person's. It has more grooves and depressions, convolutions, he called them. Well, that was all right with me. I was nodding my head in agreement when it occurred to me quite suddenly that this didn't mean very much, not really. Because I can't look at somebody's brain, even if I wanted to, you can't either. We have to depend on other ways of judging people's intelligence on how they act, what they say, what they do. The brain specialist told me about that, too. He said the brain acts as a storehouse for our knowledge. It also is the power that directs that knowledge. So when we act, we are merely putting direction to what we know. How a man acts, the direction he takes, is his own decision. It's an individual matter, and that interests me. The highly intelligent, highly moral lawyer and the deceptively crafty, highly immoral crook may well have the same amount of knowledge, but the way each directs his knowledge is entirely different. Why? Psychological fiber. That's what the brain man called it. Your psychological fiber is either weak or it's strong, so far as the pressures of living are concerned. If it's strong, the worries, the fears, the tragedies of life can't throw you off your course, can't influence your direction. But if it's weak, these same worries and fears and tragedies take on exaggerated proportions. You lose your sense of direction, and the result is fixation or obsession or insanity. Our play tonight is concerned with the brain, the man who directs it, and what happens to his psychological fiber. It is the story of Dr. Patrick Corey and Donovan's brain, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! As I sit now outside my laboratory door, writing under the heading Experiment 87, this final entry in my casebook, I know that these are the last words I shall ever write upon this earth. I neither ask nor expect forgiveness now or hereafter. And for those who seek some explanation, I refer them simply to this casebook. Let them read it carefully. From its first entry on that ill-starred day of December the 5th, December 5th. Today I bought a small capuchin monkey from an organ grinder. The animal trembled with fear when I took it into my laboratory, and when I tried to pet it, it bit me. But I had to make it trust me completely. Fear causes an excess secretion of adrenaline, resulting in an abnormal condition of the bloodstream, which would throw off my observations. So, I fed it bananas and raw egg, and finally, the creature laid its head against my shoulder. I stabbed it with a surgical lancet between the occipital bone and the first cervical vertebra. It died instantly.
Well, David, what do you think of it? Well, it's... Well, it's pretty amazing, all right. You see what I've done, don't you? Well, I... I think so. You think so? Good Lord, don't you know? Well, after all that, I'm only a second-year medical student. What of it? When I was a second-year medical student... Who is it? It's me, Dennis. Patrick, Dr. Schrott is here to see you. Oh. Well, let him come in. Uh, come in, Doctor. Thank you. Patrick didn't realize who it was. You know my son, David, of course. Oh, of course, of course. How are you, my boy? Fine, thanks, Doctor. Well, Patrick, how did work as usual, Patrick. I see? Patrick... You didn't eat the lunch I sent in to you. Or the breakfast, either. I tried to get them to, Mother. Well, I've been terribly busy, Janice. Yeah, but you've got to eat there. I know, I know. Uh, what, uh, what is it this time, Patrick? A brain. What? A brain, a brain, a monkey's brain. Oh. Uh, well, uh, what about the brain? Well, I'm trying to see how long I can keep the tissues alive. Is, uh, is that it? In that jar? Mm-hmm. There's considerably more to it than just a jar, though. You want to see how it works? Uh, well, is it still alive? In a way, yes. It's a fairly simple device, actually, Doctor. It's a variation on Carell's mechanical heart. You see, the brain lies in a bath of blood serum. These, uh, these rubber arteries are fixed to the vertebral and internal carotid arteries of the brain. And the blood substance is forced through the cycle of Willis to feed the tissues. Mm. And uh, over here, I've installed a small pressure pump that forces the blood circulation. See? But... How do you know it's alive? Well, that's very easy to determine. The brain, when functioning, gives off infinitesimal electrical impulses. And they can be measured. As a matter of fact, I've hooked the encephalograph to a small amplifying system. The brain impulses can actually be heard here. I'll turn it on. <laughs> Quite effective, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's effective, and it's, it's wrong, Patrick. It's, it's terribly wrong. I've tried to tell him, Dr. Schrott. He's trying to discover things that, that no man should discover. It's warping his whole nature. He's in here night and day. We hardly even see him anymore. Mother's right in the way, Dad. You're killing yourself with these... Will you leave us, please, Janice? You too, David. Oh, Dad. If you please, David. All right. Come on, Mother. It's wrong. It's wrong. In heaven's name, what's wrong with oh, it? Oh, you and your mechanistic philosophy. Trying to reduce life to a mere matter of chemicals and test tubes. The origin of life is from a higher domain than that, Patrick, and you're, you're, you're profaning it. Your hands are shaking. Yeah. Do you have another hard night, Doctor? Oh, you can taunt me if you like. I've made a mess of my life, that's true. But I wouldn't have a part of what you're doing for all the success in the world. Oh, nonsense. You can't stop the progress of science. Every discovery of whatever kind is a step forward. And if I can prove that the brain can perform certain functions outside the body, who knows where we may be able to go from there. How, how do you know that, that thing in there doesn't feel pain? How do you know it isn't writhing in agony? Brain tissue itself is insensitive. You know that, Doctor. But as to the feeling, look... I'll switch on the encephalograph. Notice the faintness of the amplified alpha rays? Notice the comparatively slow rate of pulsation? Now, notice what happens when I tap on the glass jar. Why? Why? It feels. It thinks. Why? I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but it certainly shows marked reaction to an external stimulus. I, I wouldn't believe it possible. Well, the trouble with you is, Schrott, you really don't believe in science. Yeah, uh, well, have it your own way, Patrick. But uh, when you can manufacture love and sympathy and kindness in a test tube, well, uh, I'll be back. Are you leaving? Yes, yes. Patrick. Yes? Uh, uh, do me a favor. Shut off the pump and let that poor thing in there die. <laughs> Let it die? Yes, yes. Why, if it were within my power to grant, that little brain would live forever. December 10th. I'm utterly exhausted from lack of sleep, but the events of the past five days have been of such tremendous importance that I must set them down while every last detail is still fresh in my mind for I've had no time to make an entry in this second, in this record, since the day last week. It seems months ago now. 
when I had my first partial success with the brain of the capuchin monkey. At that time, however, it seemed that I was doomed to disappointment. In spite of all my efforts, the brain of the monkey ceased to live at 12.14 at night. Tired and disheartened, I lay down to sleep on the cot in my laboratory. But at that very moment, fate was contriving an occurrence which now seems destined to have the most profound effect not only upon my own existence, but perhaps upon that of all mankind. Hello! What is it? Dad! Well, come in, come in. What's the matter? It's Dr. Schrott. Schrott? Well, what in the world does he want? It's two o'clock in the morning. Well, there's been an accident or something. He's pretty upset. What, what of it? Where is he? Well, he went outside again. He's at the laboratory door. Well? All right. Patrick. Oh. Oh, thanks heaven, my boy. Thank heaven. Well, what's the matter? There's... There's been a plane crash on the mountains. Oh, only one of them left alive. I, I brought him this far, but he, he, he needs immediate operation. <laughs> That's your job. You're county physician. Patrick. Patrick, it's multiple fractures of both legs. The arteries are severed. The, the legs will have to be amputated. Uh, well, you're not in any shape to do the job. Well, that's not my fault. Take him to the Phoenix Hospital. I'm not going to take the responsibility. It's too far. We'd never get there in time. Oh, Patrick, please, please. It may mean a man's life and... and, 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 yes, and... Your job as county physician, huh? I'm not thinking of that. But he's an important man. William H. Donovan. D Donovan? The Wall Street Donovan? Yes. Oh, you've got to help me, Patrick. Uh, uh, well, what are his chances? Oh, uh, about even if we hurry. Well, bring him in. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, my boy. Uh, you better get some things on, David. You may have to help. Oh, sure, Dad. Oh, yeah, David. Thanks. David. Yes, Dad. Uh, don't say anything to your mother. I don't wish her to be disturbed. Oh, sure, I know. We'll use the laboratory table. Before you go, put the instruments to the sterilizer. And don't forget the Geely saw. Oh, right. Oh, but... But what? Oh, I... I thought the Geely saw was only used for... for brain surgery or not always? Now, hurry. They're bringing him in from the car. Now, now oh, hurry up. In here now. In here. Careful, please. Put him right there on that table, please. Yes, Doctor. Easy. Uh, Better get yourself a gown and gloves, Doctor. Uh, uh, right over there. You won't have time to scrub. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Well, bad, isn't it? Pulse rapid? Heart very faint? Uh, I wasn't sure we'd even make it to here. Oh, David. Oh, uh, yes, Dad. Half cc of adrenaline, David. One to one thousand intravenous. Right. You men can go now. Is there anything else? No, no, thank you. Uh, Patrick, Patrick. I'd rather we... we were alone, if you don't mind. Uh, good night, then, Dr. Schreiber. Uh, uh, good night, and, and thank you. Uh, now, David. David, if you'll remove the blanket from his legs. That's it. Uh -huh. uh, you see? Fortunately, a forest ranger got to him right after the crash and had sense enough to put a tourniquet on each leg. But even so... <laughs> What's that he's saying? Uh, something like, sure, sure, sure. He, he said it over and over. Well, that's funny. He's got a foreign accent. Uh, he's an Armenian, I think. He changed his name to yeah, Donovan. I hadn't realized he was deformed. Well, it doesn't show as much in his pictures. No, uh, Patrick, I, I think we ought to begin. There's no use amputating those legs. No use? He'll be dead anyway by morning. Well, won't he? Well, I, 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 I suppose you're right, Patrick. You but, know I'm right. Uh, but still, we ought to try. Uh, we can't refuse to operate just because... We uh, are going to operate. Syringe, please, David. The large one. Here you are, Dad. Anesthetic. Will you give it, Dr. Yeah, uh, Right, right. Scalpel, please, David. And the Geely saw. Geely saw? Patrick! Well? No. No, I won't let you. After your performance tonight? Uh, but, but he's still alive. Precisely. My mistake with the monkey was that he was dead. I don't intend to make it again. Come, come, David, this scalpel. Are you out of your mind? You're taking a man's life. I'm giving him life. Donovan won't die anyway. I mean, he would die, of course. But for a while, at least. Donovan's brain will live. Uh, you 
You better hurry. They'll be coming for the body pretty soon. You can go now, David. Well, I, I think I will, then. David, uh, you understand, of course. Yes, I understand. Not a word to your mother or to anyone. I understand. Patrick, will the skull... I bandaged the whole cranium. It didn't look like any head injury. <laughs> I hope nobody gets any ideas about an autopsy. Oh, the coroner, you can stop that. You drive a hard bargain, don't you, Patrick? You'd better sign the death certificate before they get here. You know this is blackmail. Want a drink? You don't have to do that. I'll sign it. I'm sorry, but it was a chance that comes once in a lifetime. William Donovan has one of the greatest minds, has one of the greatest brains in the world today. And now you have it. It's madness, Patrick. You think I won't succeed? Succeed in what? Turn on the encephalograph. Yeah. Simple alpha waves. No different from the monkeys. You can't take a human brain out of its body and expect it to function. It never occurred to you that the brain might simply be asleep? Asleep? Certainly. Operation like this is a severe shock. Now, tap on the glass. Lord, Patrick, Delta Waves, it was asleep. You woke it up. It's actually conscious. Yes. There are three of us conducting this experiment now, Shrout. You and me and William Horace Donovan. December 17th. I moved my bed into my laboratory, but I scarcely slept in six days. There can no longer be any doubt that the brain responds like a sensitive seismograph to vibrations near it, including the sound of my voice. Yet I found no method of communication with it. I have devised a simplified Morse code consisting of taps on the glass container together with voice vibrations. Perhaps we can teach the brain. December 22nd. Shrat has come to stay with me, half out of a feeling that he shares with me a common guilt, half out of scientific curiosity. But I have scarcely seen him, and both David and Janice have been avoiding me. Not that I really care. I have been tapping out my code on the side of the brain's container endlessly, day and night, over and over a thousand times, so that a baby could learn it if the brain can learn. I sleep only when the brain itself falls into exhausted slumber. When it wakes again, I resume my tapping. Shrout! Shrout! Wake up! Yes, 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 Patrick. Get up! Hurry! Well, what's the matter? Is Come. something the matter? Come, I want you to see something. Oh, Patrick, you, you, you look like a Hurry. ghost. Where, where are we going? Back to the laboratory. I can't believe it myself. I may have been dreaming. Delirious. What happened? What Come, happened? Come on. You hear that? The delta waves. Yeah, it seems disturbed. You've got to check my observations for me. If my reasoning is wrong, tell me. I, I can't be sure of anything anymore. Yes, Patrick, yes. Now, now listen carefully, Doctor. You know I've been trying to communicate with the brain in code. Now, if I were able to cause a distinctive pattern of the brain's delta waves by a specific command in code, if the brain responded with the same pattern of sound each time I issued the command, it would prove that I had succeeded in communicating with the brain, wouldn't it? Yes, Patrick, yes, I, I think it would. Now... Listen. Donovan. Donovan. If you understand, think three times of the word talk. Three times. Talk. 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 It answered. It spoke. Try it yourself. Just as I did the same word three times. Uh, Donovan. Talk. 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 Then I'm right. It's true. Patrick, this... This thing has learned to talk. (laughs) 
December 23rd. Schwartz romanticizing, of course. The Delta pattern is so infinitely complex that it would be utterly, utterly impossible ever to break it down into specific words. Yet that it understands me, that it's trying to communicate with me, is certain. Schwartz suggests mental telepathy, that I try to make my mind a blank, as the mediums call it, while at the same time increasing the energy content in the plasma that feeds the brain in the hope of stepping up the brain's electrical potential, as one would step up the power of a radio station. But naturally, telepathy is nonsense. But the feeding theory intrigues me. I shall try it. December 31st. Notice today, for the first time, two distinct nodules of new brain cells on the frontal lobex. Electrical potential is increased to 510 microvolts. I've begun smoking cigars, although I've always hated them before. Nerves, I expect. January 6th. Nodule still growing. Electrical potential 1450, but with no observable results. I've lately felt a compelling urge to know more of Donovan's life and have com collected every available scrap of information about him. Strange man, ruthless, actually evil in many ways, but nonetheless an extraordinarily brilliant mind. wake you up, Patrick. You were uh? moaning in your sleep and talking. <laughs> talking? What did I say? I'm, I'm not sure, but your voice was so strange that... Janice, uh, Janice uh, what's the matter? Oh, that's nothing. I was dreaming, that's all. Janice woke me up. Patrick. Patrick, let me see your hand. No, 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 no. the other one. Well, what about it? You're, uh, you're not left-handed, are you? I know. Then why have you got ink on the fingers of your left hand? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, were you writing anything tonight? No. Why, you must have been, Patrick. Here it is, right here on your desk. Nonsense. I... Wait. Let me, s let me see it. Well, you've been writing his name. Will you make Donovan? Schrott! That's not my handwriting. It's... What? What? Well, don't you see what it means? The brain has communicated with me. Patrick, you don't mean... Look here. Uh, look, at this look at this magazine article. Here's a reproduction of his signature. And he was left-handed, too. It says so here. It is. It's exactly the same. What a fool I've been. Look at this picture. Smoking a cigar with his left hand. I wondered why I'd suddenly started smoking cigars. And the, the same brand, too. Janice. Janice, try to remember what you heard me saying just before you woke me tonight. Now think. Patrick, I... I can't believe... Think, Janice. All I heard was something like, sure, sure, sure. Sure, of course. Don't you remember, Shot? He said it that night. It was the only thing we ever heard him say. It was an expression of his. It, it tells about it in one of the articles, too. It... it wasn't your voice, Patrick. You see? Aha, uh -huh, you were right, Shot. The brain has grown. And it's strong enough to influence not only the higher functions of the frontal lobe, but the speech centers, the motor centers of another brain. Patrick. Patrick, if this is true, then your experiment has been successful. It's ended. Ended? Why, it's only begun. Patrick! Don't you see what this means? Patrick, listen to me. What, Janice? What? You've got to stop. Stop? I can't stand it any longer. Can't you see where it's led you? When you cut yourself off from your family... When you neglected your health and began having fits of temper and were like... Like someone I hardly recognize as the man I married. All that I tried to understand. But don't you see what you've done? You're a murderer, Patrick. 
A murderer! Janice! David told me the whole thing. The poor boy's half insane himself from worry. Insane? What do you mean by that? What I say! You killed Donovan. Maybe he wouldn't have lived anyway. But you killed him. And now this... This thing has gained such power over your mind that it can make you do things you don't even know about. Oh. For all you know, it could make you do... Anything. Anything! You've got to choose, Patrick. Janice, please. I I suppose you're right, but I'm utterly exhausted. I can't even think anymore. You've got to think. Give me until tomorrow. Let me sleep, and then tomorrow I'll do something, I promise you. All right, Patrick. But if you don't do something, if you don't destroy that thing, I will! Listen! Listen! Oh, I hate it! Janice, it's almost as though it had heard you and were raging at you. <laughs> Way, please, Dr. Corey. <laughs> but, Patrick, why are we going in here? A psychiatric I told clinic? you I'd do something, darling, and I've got an idea. You mean having yourself psychoanalyzed? Something like that? Something like that. I'll tell you about it later, dear. First, I want to talk to this man alone. Dr. Zanga, this is Dr. Corey. Oh, how do you do, Dr. Corey? Ah, I've heard something of your work. Oh, yes. Oh, and uh, this is... Uh, Mrs. Corey. Oh, of course. Excuse me. Uh, I'm happy to meet you, Mrs. Corey. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, won't you come into my office, Doctor? Yeah, uh, Janice, would you mind waiting here in the reception room? I I'll be out in just a moment. Why, certainly, dear. Uh, in here, please. Well, Doctor, she seems quite normal. I had expected from what you told me on the phone. Yes, I know, but I... I can assure you, deeply as it pains me to do so, that she is quite insane. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Paranoia. She's always been a little jealous of my work, but lately she's developed a most extraordinary delusion. Hmm. She, she thinks that I've created some sort of a monster in my laboratory that controls, that, that, that controls my mind, my, my action. Yeah, I have uh, heard of such cases. In it was a great shock to me. I thought of you at once, of course. I'm putting her completely in your hands. Well, it is a little unusual, but since you are yourself a medical man... I know you do everything you can. Yes, you, you definitely wish, then, to commit her, huh? Yes. Yes. You have the papers. Uh, here they are. Uh, just your signature will be enough. Hmm. There you are. Mm. You, <clears throat> you'll keep me informed. Oh, won't you? Naturally, naturally. Well, goodbye then, Dr. Corey. We will do what we can. Patrick? Uh, Mrs. Corey is staying with us, Miss Wilcox. Yes, Dr. Sanger. Patrick, come back. Oh, it's all right, Mrs. Corey. Patrick? Just come inside with me, please. Patrick! No, no, no. Where are you going? Come along, Mrs. Corey. Let me go. Oh, it's all right. Come Let back. me go! Oh, please. Yes? About the bill, how do you wish it to be handled? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I'll take care of it by the week. The checks will be signed William Edge Donovan. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> January 15th. It's nearly a week now since Janice went away. I cannot understand how she could have left me just when I needed her most. When I try to question Schrott or David about her, they only look at me strangely and change the subject. Clearly, they too are in on the conspiracy. Sometimes, it seems, the only person I can trust is Donovan, the brain. It communicates with me more freely now each day. I know it has some great plan in mind for me, for both of us. And I'm waiting, patiently waiting. Donovan, I'm listening, Donovan. Don't be angry, Donovan. I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm listening, Donovan. I'm listening. Yeah. <laughs> 
Tonight's full hour of suspense, Mr. John McIntyre appears as Dr. Patrick Corey in William Spears' production of Donovan's Brain. Tonight's study in suspense. In just a moment, we will return with Act Two of Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, back to our Hollywood soundstage and your host for Suspense... Mr. Robert Montgomery. At the outset of Experiment 87, we were concerned with a man of science who had a wife and a son whom he loved and who loved him. He was a gifted scientist, dedicated to his work, and he signed his name with his right hand, Dr. Patrick Corey. That was before Donovan's brain. That was before his psychological fiber weakened against the force of a powerful obsession And with this weakening, his power to direct his knowledge has become twisted. Now we look again at Dr. Patrick Corey, man of science. He has alienated friends and family. He has had his wife committed to an institution. His entire life has become a thing contained in a vat, controlled by pounding electric waves, and he signs his name with his left hand, William H. Donovan. And now with John McIntyre as Dr. Patrick Corey, And with Act Two of Donovan's Brain, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! January 16th. It is now six weeks, exactly 42 days. For six weeks, by artificial means alone, I have kept alive... A human brain, completely detached from the body, floating in the bath of serum, nourished by a synthetic blood plasma fed through its arteries by an electric pump, it has remained alive. Not only alive, but I have succeeded in communicating with it. For I have even induced new growth of brain cells and so tremendously increased its mental faculties that by sheer brain power alone it is actually able to communicate its thoughts to me. And each day, My communion with that living, pulsing mass of gray matter that was the brain of William Donovan becomes stronger and stronger. Even now I sense it striving to reveal some plan to me. Something so truly world-shaking in its implications that only such an organism developed to a point thousands of years ahead of its time could ever have conceived it. So far I sense this only. But soon I shall know. Indeed, I shall be a partner in its execution. What a fool I was ever to have considered for a moment my wife's demands that I end the experiment. It's because I refused, of course, that Janice left me a week ago without so much as a word of explanation of farewell. Even my son David and my assistant Schrott are privy to this conspiracy to thwart me. For when I asked about Janice, they pretended to know nothing or seek to avoid my questions. But... The brain will live. I can hear it now. Its delta waves, quite audible over the amplifying system I've arranged for it, almost as though it were calling to me, trying to speak to me. Yes, the brain will live. Donovan. Donovan, what is it? What are you trying to tell me? Go on, Donovan, go on. I'm listening. Go on. Who is it? It's me, Patrick and David. What do you want? We want to talk to you, Dad. I have no time to talk. I'm busy. Please open the door, Patrick. It's important. Go away. I tell you I'm busy. Please, Dad. Can't you leave me alone? But... All right, all right. Uh, Thanks. Now, what is it? Patrick, won't you come into the study with us for a few minutes? Whatever you got to say, you can say right here. You know I can't leave the laboratory. Dad, it's only that... We wanted to talk to you in in private. Don't tell me that you're afraid of this poor mass of brain cells. No, it's not that, Dad. Never mind, David. At least turn that thing off then, will you, Patrick? (laughs) What difference would that make? It could still hear, couldn't it? All right, well, what is it? It's... it's about Mother. Oh. So she put you up to this, did she? I thought the truth would come out sometime. Dad, listen. She tried to stop this experiment from the beginning. 
She thought she could blackmail into quitting by leaving me. And she still does. And now she's using you as I a think... go-between. Patrick, please, listen a minute. I've heard enough. We haven't heard a word from Janice. We don't know where she is. That's what we came in to talk about. Oh, have you? Well, how should I know where she is? Because... Because you were the last person seen with her, Dad. I was. Don't you remember, Patrick? You took her into town with you. You wouldn't tell any of us why. Oh, oh yes. Of course. For a moment, I'd forgotten. But what of it? Don't you remember what happened then? Well, of course I remember. She left me, that's all. Well, where, Dad? Where did she leave you? What were you doing? I, I, I don't know. We were in some big public building. It's the city hall, courthouse, the taxes or something. And the next thing I knew, she simply disappeared. Is that all? Didn't she say anything? Didn't she, uh, didn't she at least tell you why she was going? How do I remember what she said? It's been a week and more. I've hardly slept. And you know I've been working night and day. Yes, that's just it, Patrick. What do you mean by that? Patrick, you say that this, the brain communicates with you. Tells you thing, uh, things about its past life. Suggests thoughts. Well, if the brain can make you think things, why can't it also make you forget things? <clears throat> Leave me alone. Dad, are you sure? Are you sure you don't know what's happened to Mother? No, no, I tell you. But no. don't you see what you might have done? In heaven's name, stop now while there's still time. Get out of while here. While there's still time to help Janice, if there is. While there's still time to help yourself, Patrick. Shut off the current. You... Let the brain die. Kill it, Patrick. Kill it. Get Kill out. it. Both of you. Get out. Get out! The brain continues to commence more and more easily, but nothing further on what I have come to think of as the plan. I am now sleeping a great deal, but my dreams are becoming increasingly troublesome, although I am at a loss to analyze them. Most frequent is a sort of vast cosmic ballet presided over by the colossal figure of a young man whom I seem to recognize, and yet I never see his face. It is as though the entire population of the Earth were moving past him in review at his command. No, 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 David, don't let him touch oh, me. Lady. Don't let him touch me. It's all right now. Here. Here's a glass of water. Yeah. Well, what's the matter? You're trembling all over. I... I can't. What are you looking at me that way for? You look frightened half to death. Dead? Well, what happened here anyway? I came in and found you on the floor with your hands around your own throat. If it hadn't been for me, what... Why's your luggage all packed? I, I was going to leave. Leave? In the middle of the night? Why? Because I... The fuse box. It's been opened. It was you, Schrott. You were going to shut off the current. You were going to kill that brain. Patrick, you tried to strangle me. What? It's true, Dad. That's why I had to slap you. But that's absurd. I came in here and I found Schrott with his hands around his own throat. He was strangling himself. Dad, please think a minute. Nobody can strangle himself. Look at these marks on my throat. You think I could have done that? No, it's not possible. And yet... It's true, Patrick, true, that I tried to shut off the current. I was afraid for you. But as I opened the fuse box, I heard the delta waves in the laboratory suddenly become stronger and louder than they'd ever been before. And then... And then I... Yes, yes. Then the brain... You... You even spoke in Donovan's voice, Patrick. His voice? Yes, that recurring phrase of his, sure, 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 in his very tones, his very accent. You've created a monster, Patrick. It has the power to make me commit murder. Patrick, what about Janice? Shot, you... You don't think I, I... I couldn't have done a thing like that. You couldn't have done what you did tonight if you'd been yourself? No, no, I... Even a hypnotist can't force a man to... Don't, don't worry about it now, Patrick. 
It's probably all right. We'll try to find it tomorrow. Uh, we'll do everything we can, but first... Dad, don't you see? Dr. Schrott was right. You've got to destroy... Uh, well, maybe... Maybe then I could remember it, yes. The brain must die. Pull the switch in the fuse box. It will only be a matter of seconds then. Yes. But... You've got to, Patrick. Schrott! David! Help me, I can't move. Come to me. Pull the switch. Hurry, stop. David, go on. You. You do. It's, it's paralyzed us, Patrick. The brain won't let itself be killed. Then it has the power to live on and on to command us as long as we live. To make us do anything it wants. To kill, murder. Dad, what are we going to do? Listen. Crane. It's, it's laughing. February 2nd. Shrat has left. He had to, of course, for his own protection, if nothing else. Before he left, I swore him to eternal secrecy. And he's going to try to find Janice. The very thought that any harm might have come to her through me is enough to drive me almost mad. As for David, he's strong enough to prevent any untoward accidents. And he's volunteered to stay with me. He'll sleep at night behind locked doors. We must devote every faculty we possess, together and independently, to finding a way of destroying the brain. Perhaps while it sleeps, although it seems to have developed tremendous powers of the subconscious which operate even in sleep. A recurring dream. The now oppressive sense of some further task to be performed continues. Oh, if Janice were only here, even her presence I know would help immeasurably to combat this fearful thing. A terrible thought crosses my mind. Could Schrott have left if the brain had not, for some reasons of its own, actually wanted him to leave? <laughs> February 6th. My thoughts are less and less my own. The dream of the young giant bestriding the earth, the figure without a face, pursues me now, even in my waking hours. Increasingly, I seem to live in a world of evil fancy peopled and controlled by the mind of William Donovan. And worst of all is the obsession that there is some fateful role not yet revealed to me that I have been assigned to play in it. But I've not given up hope. I must destroy the brain. The possibility has occurred to me. I must give it more thought. If Janice were only here. Janice, my darling. How are you, Patrick? Why, well, well enough. But Janice, where have you been? Where have I been? Yes, we had no idea. I've been half crazy worrying about you. Did Schrott finally find you? Uh-huh. Uh, Schrott found me. Well, Janice, why did you leave me that day? Why didn't you at least tell me? Where, where did you go? I was with friends. Did Schrott tell you anything? No. N nothing special. Janice, I know I haven't been a very good husband these last months. I haven't been very kind or considerate or even civilized. I haven't been myself, Janice. I know, Patrick. My poor darling. But if you'd only known how I missed you after you left, how I needed you, I, I need your help, Janice. I know, Patrick. I came back to help you. But, but what? Where's... Only oh, sleep in the next room ever since... That is, that lately he's, he's tried to make it a point to sleep only when I do. Keep an eye on things. Patrick, I'm going to help you 
all I can, any way I can. I'm going to, but first, I want to take David away. David? Because I don't think it's good for him to be here. I don't think that you... Then Schrott did tell you. Yes, Patrick, he did. Oh, Janice, Janice, Janice. I don't know what to do. My mind is only half my own. Lately, I don't even know what I'm... What I myself... Or whether I'm someone else. It's... It's like some frightful nightmare. Only I don't wake up. I'm afraid I'll never wake up. My poor dearest... Janice. You... You do love me still. Yes, Patrick. It's the only thing I have left, Janice. It's what I've counted on and clung to. And that somehow, out of your love, you'd find a way to help. No one else can. I know. Poor old Schrott didn't even dare to come back. Yes, well, I can't blame him. Patrick, I don't want to torment you. It's only that perhaps we can find a way if we know all the facts. What, Janice? Don't you really know where I was? No, how could I? Don't you remember where you took me? Well, I took you? You took me to a psychiatric clinic, Patrick. You had me committed. Oh, Janice. No, Patrick. Not you. Donovan. It was because I tried to make you stop the experiment. Kill the brain. As you left me there, you even spoke in Donovan's voice. Sure, 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 you said. I thought they were the last words I would ever hear you speak. Oh, Janice, forgive me. I couldn't persuade anyone I was sane. After what you told them, everything I said only made them think I was mad. I'm not mad, am I, Patrick? I'm not mad. <laughs> Janice will be gone for some three hours. I have sent her into town for Dr. Zanger, the psychiatrist. Maybe he can help. But now I'm overcome with the thought of the humiliation I shall have to suffer when other medical men become aware of the position I'm in. It will be the end of my career, my reputation, all my hopes. It's folly to think that Zanger would keep it to himself. Indeed, he would have no right to. I can bear it if I must. But another way... A possibility came to me yesterday, and I've been thinking it over. There's no harm in trying it in an event. I must try. I have three hours. David! David? Yes, Dad? David, what's your blood type, do you know? Oh, as a matter of fact, I don't think I do. Why? Well, no matter. We can easily find out. David, I think at last I know a way. To kill the brain? Yes, it's simple. Perfectly natural. And yet nine chances out of ten is something Donovan would never have known about. I do it myself, but unfortunately my blood type is the same as his. Oh, a transfusion? Of course. I have to replenish the blood substance periodically anyhow. It's about time to do it again. I've always used my own because it was the same type as his. But if yours is a different type, the right type. Well, you mean the wrong type? Yes. Given the wrong type, the brain will die. Yes. It sounds possible. I'm sure of it. I know it. Oh, but, but suppose the brain knows. It, it knows other things. Yes, I thought of that. It's a chance we'll have to take. If you're willing. Oh, of course I am, Dad. Then we'll take a blood sample now. Come to the laboratory. If only I have the right type. Or rather, the wrong type. If you haven't, we'll find someone who has. Maybe Schrott. Now, just lie down there on the table. You want a tourniquet. On your arm? There. <clears throat> I'll, I'll put it on. This, all, this small syringe will do it. Now. Uh, go ahead. I'm ready. Uh, David, don't watch me. It will be easier if you don't for me. Well, that's a funny one. Coming from you. Well, doctors are never quite as steady with members of their own family, you know. Ready? Sure. <coughs> there we are. You all right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm all right. Me through in just a second. You getting it all right? Yes, yeah, just a second now. Dad. 
I'm sleepy. You'll be over it in a moment. But what's the matter? Why am I so so sleepy? You'll be all right. Sleepy. So sleepy. That is what anesthetic is for, to make you sleep. I was somewhat surprised to find the instrument sterilized and already lying out. But I worked more rapidly and skillfully than ever before in my life. I made an incision just below the hairline, laying back the scalp as far as the base of the skull. I trepanned the cranium at two centimeter intervals, working back and downwards to the upper edge of the occipital bone. With a GD saw, I cut through the connecting bone structure and removed the entire top of the cranium, placing it in saline solution to preserve it. I made a semicircular incision in the dura mater, laying it to one side, exposing the brain. As I dissected out the facial, auditory, and pneumogastric nerves to free the medulla oblongata, I became conscious of an insistent clamoring. Something like a mounting hysteria in the distant reaches of my mind. Almost as strong as the irresistible compulsion that drove me on. But my hand did not falter. With a sure stroke, I severed the spinal cord. Just below the first cervical nerve. As I make this last entry, with that awful guilt upon my soul, even now I cannot fully comprehend how it has been possible for any man, by mortal or immortal means, to be driven to such a crime. Even the divinity himself did not demand of Abraham that final sacrifice of expiation, when he, with his only begotten son, ascended the Mount of Olives. Perhaps Schrott is right. Perhaps there is indeed in man some spark of the divine that will elude our test tubes and our laboratories until the end of time. Perhaps that is the one thing that even Donovan did not foresee. I only know that at the instant my son died under my own hand, I was set free. At that instant, I saw and understood for the first time that monstrous plan born in the brain of William Donovan of which I was to be the instrument. It was the plan I had glimpsed but never grasped in the recurring dream. Donovan did aspire to the domination of the world. And with those tremendous mental faculties that I myself had given him, it was literally within his power to become the absolute ruler of all mankind. Only one thing was lacking, a body. A young, strong body into which those ever-growing brain cells could graft and affix themselves and live on, perhaps, for centuries. He chose the body of my son. And now at last, too late, I am free to destroy this foul thing of my creation. I know it as surely as I know that my own life must be the forfeit. The brain also knows. I could hear the disturbed, erratic oscillations of the delta waves coming through the laboratory door. But there's no room left in me now for fear. I shall take the six steps from the desk where I am writing across to the laboratory door. How often I have taken them in happier times. I shall open the door, close it behind me for the last time, and write finis to the mortal life of Patrick Arthur Corey and the brain of William Horace Donovan. May others learn from the record I leave here the lesson I have learned so bitterly and profit by them. And for the things I have done, may God have mercy on my soul.
Arizona, February 7th. The bodies of Dr. Patrick Arthur Corey and his son David were found in Dr. Corey's own laboratory early today. Young Corey had apparently died on the operating table as a result of a delicate brain operation performed by his father. In the case of Dr. Corey, there was nothing to indicate the cause of death. But medical authorities who viewed the body, including the famous Dr. Gustav Zanger, gave us their opinions that he might have died of a shock as the result of the unsuccessful operation on his son. A curious feature of the case was the fact that numerous pieces of tissue, identified as being from a human brain, were found scattered about the laboratory floor, while a larger section of brain was found in the midst of an elaborate apparatus, evidently part of a scientific experiment. Med medical authorities stated, however, that they were unable to explain the nature of the apparatus and that the brain itself was in such a state of decomposition as to indicate that it had been dead and slowly decaying for at least two months. Dr. Corey is survived by his wife, Janice. She was committed to the county asylum for the insane late this afternoon. Burial of Dr. Corey and his son will be at the Mount of Olives Cemetery. <laughs> For a superb performance as Dr. Corey, our appreciation and thanks to John McIntyre. Tell me something. If you were going to make a room in your home available for renting, would you accept this man? He's personable in manner and appearance, and he pays well. He's alone, no wife, no children, no pets. He owns a Bible, reads it, and quotes from it freely. He asks only to live undisturbed in a quiet room. There, I think that's about all. Uh, no, there is one thing more. He has one abiding dislike. He can't stand sin. Well, how about it? Would you rent him a room? I suggest you wait to answer. Yes, I strongly suggest you wait until next week when I appear at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Bunting as the lodger from the famous novel, novel by Mary Bellock Lowndes. Mr. Montgomery may currently be seen in the Universal International production, Ride the Pink Horse. John McIntyre may soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Northside 777. Donovan's Brain by Kurt Siodmak was adapted for suspense by Robert L. Richards and was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Lud Gluskin is our musical director and conductor, and Lucian Morrowek composes the original scores. Next week, hear Robert Montgomery as The Lodger on radio's outstanding theater of thrills, one hour of... Suspense! This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense! Tonight, The Singing Wall, starring Van Johnson. Have another cup. Another nice hot cup. Yeah, <laughs> if that special cream makes it taste so good. So a guy named Joe brought you, huh? He come up here from Joe's place. From Joe's place. <laughs> right out of the wall. Singing walls. We got hot and cold running water here and singing walls, yeah. <laughs> Have another cup and a little more of the extra heavy cream. What? Well, lie down and take a little snooze. I'll be right back. Look at you. It's blood. Blood all over your shirt. Oh, him? He's all right. Just lock him in the closet. Put the key right in your pocket so you'll know just where to find him. Sure, I 
I'll be back. I'll be back in just a minute. No, no, let me out. Let me out of here. No, no, let me out of here. No. What's the matter? Tommy, wake up. What? What is it? I've been knocking at your door the longest time. You were having a dream or something. Yeah. Gee, what time is it? It's way afternoon. You came in pretty late. I did, huh? Toss me my bathrobe, will you, sis? Don't you know what time you got in? No, no, not exactly. Oh, Tommy, I know it's tough not having a job all these months. But the kind of people you're getting... Oh, oh my head. You have anything to eat last night? Yeah, yeah. They bought me some coffee and... Coffee? Who did? Where was this? Oh, well, honest, sis, it's, it's no alibi, but I don't remember where I was. Only just now I seem to be dreaming about it. About what? About last night. I could hear you banging on the door all the time I was dreaming. And it seemed as though I wasn't dreaming, dreaming at all. I was remembering a lot of things. What sort of things? Oh, I was all mixed up. There was, there was a guy with a kind of frog voice that kept giving me eats and coffee. And I was sort of floating. And there, were, there was a place with music coming out of the walls. There was something about blood on my shirt and a key to a closet. Tommy, you're shaking like a leaf. Yeah, it's a pretty scary dream, all right. If it was a dream. Well, you get dressed and come on downstairs. Here, here, I'll get your clean shirt. No, I, I better wear the old one. I've worn it only once. But it's all messy. Yeah, it does look kind of. Mildred. What? My shirt. Give me it. Now what's the matter? Look, Mildred. That's blood. Well, I guess it is. I know it is. Just like it was in the dream. Oh, Tommy, don't be silly. You must have hurt yourself somewhere. But I didn't. Look, there isn't a scratch on me. Well, then you got in a fight. Maybe. What else could it have been? That's what I'm trying to think. Well, stop thinking and hurry up and get dressed. Oh, my goodness. Look at the way you threw your clothes around last night. Trousers on the floor here. Oh, dear. Everything all over the place fell out of the pockets. I'll pick it up. You get dressed. Thanks. Didn't come home with much, did you? I didn't have much to start with. Well, I'll put it all up here on the bureau. 25 cents and change in your keys. Now, hurry, will you? What did you say? I said hurry. No. Oh, I said I put your change in your keys up on the bureau. Keys? Yeah. Mildred, I only have one key. Well, there are two there now. I know. Let me see them. Here. One's the key to the front door. But the other one? Doesn't belong to any door in this house. It's the key to the closet. What closet? Last night. It wasn't a dream. Tommy, what are you talking about? Mildred, you better call Danny. Danny, right away. But he's on duty. I know, I know, but get him over here right away. Tommy, what is it? Last night. I think I killed a man. Yeah. Let me look at your eyes, Tom. Listen, Denny. Uh-huh. You were doped, all right? I didn't know what it was. Never mind that now, kid. How much do you remember? Oh, Denny, I hated to bring you in on this, but I didn't know who else to go to. Skip it, skip it. What's the use of having a brother-in-law who's a cop if he can't help you once in a while? How much do you remember? Just what I've told you. Just like it was in the dream. Only it wasn't a dream. There, w there was this guy, Joe. Just some guy I'd known from someplace. I don't know where. And I met on the street, and he took me to the party. Then the guy with the frog voice began giving me eats and coffee. Had a lot of coffee. Then everything got confused. And I was in the place with the singing wall. Some harmonica playing or something. That's where the closet was. What about the guy you... The dead guy? Uh, first he wasn't there. And then he was. He was sort of slumped over in a big armchair. And then frog voice put him in the closet? Uh, that's what I remember. And then he left. And I suddenly seemed to realize that the guy in the closet was dead. That's when I get out of there. I don't know how. I don't know how. You don't have any idea where it was? No, I didn't even know where the party was. And you never even seen any of these people before? Except this guy, Joe, who took me to the party. And that's all I know about him. Just a guy named Joe that I knew by sight from someplace. But I don't know where, or his last name, or anything. Whew. That's not much to go on, is it, kid? No, not much. A guy named Joe, singing walls in a closet, and another guy with a froggy voice. Oh, I'd recognize him. Or his voice, if I ever saw him again. Tommy, you're in a jam, kid. The way it looks right now, there's a, there's a dead man in a closet somewhere in this town, and you killed him. Maybe you didn't. And if we find him before somebody else does, maybe we can figure out what did happen. 
But the way it stands now, kid, you're it. Yeah, I know. And we haven't got much time either. If the place is an apartment, they've probably found the body already. And I'd know about it. If it's a hotel, they check the guest out by 6 o'clock. That gives us, uh, about four hours. Four hours for the murderer to find the guy he murdered. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Tell me. You know how I feel about Mildred. And you know I don't exactly hate you either. You know I'll do everything in the world I possibly can to clear you. Sure, Danny, I know, I know. But I'm a cop, Tommy. And if you did do it, you know I'm going to turn you in, don't you? Sure. I know that, too. Okay, kid, okay. Now, let's start from the beginning. What about this guy, Joe? But I don't know anything about him. You know his name, you know his face. Now, think, Tommy, think. I'm trying to. Oh, if I could only remember. If I could only remember. So a guy named Joe brought you, huh? You come up here from Joe's place. Joe's place. <laughs> You see, Tommy, when you remember that, you told me where Joe is. I did? Yeah, sure. You see that sign over that restaurant? Yeah, Joe's place. Joe's place, yeah! Tommy, you were playing with bad boys last night, and this is where bad boys hang out. So? It all clicked when I remembered you said the guy with the frog voice asked you if you came up there from Joe's place. He didn't mean where Joe lived or anything. He meant this place. He thought maybe you were one of the boys. Well, how did I ever meet this Joe? I've never been here in my life. He runs another place more respectable as a sort of cover. About three blocks from our house, the grotto. Hey, that's right. Yeah, remember now? If my hunch is right, Joe is going to be plenty surprised when he sees you walk in there. Me? Walk in there? Now, don't worry, kid. Just walk in and sit down at the table. If you're not out of that place in a couple of minutes, I'll know you recognize the guy and we're on the right track. I'll come in as though I didn't see you and go to the phone booth. Then what? Then we'll see, kid. Are you okay? Okay. Oh. Oh, one, one thing more. If he offers you anything to eat or drink, take it. Sure. Well, here goes. What'll it be, Mac? Orange juice. Right. Well, 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 well. What do you know? Hello, Tommy. Well, hi, Joe. <laughs> what are you doing down in this part of town, kid, huh? Oh, I had to come down and see a guy. I didn't know you had this place. Ah, uh, just a little sideline. That's where I first started, you know. Sure. One orange juice. It'll be ten cents. Oh, no. You got to have a little something to eat on me, kid. What do you have? Coffee, at least, huh? Well... A nice hot cup? Yeah, okay. Coffee for the gentleman, Larry. With the uh, extra heavy cream. Understand? The extra heavy? Sure. I'll take tea with lemon. Hey, tell me. That was some fun last night, huh? Yeah. Yeah. What you disappeared to? I was looking all over for you. Oh, that's the funny thing. I don't even remember. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> well, a guy has to cut loose once in a while. <laughs> Here you are. One coffee with extra heavy cream. One tea. Well, this will warm you up. Wait a minute. Hey, who are you? Oh, this is my brother-in-law, Denny. This is Joe. Say, you must have got things mixed up. You never drink coffee, Tommy. You only drink tea. Yeah, that's that's right. Here, you take the tea, give Joe the coffee, and I'll take the orange juice. I, uh, I don't like coffee. I, I never touch it. Okay, I'll take it. Thanks. By the way, Joe, you haven't got a little bottle I could pour this into, have you? Hey, who do you think you're kidding, bub? I'm from headquarters. Here's a badge. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. I, I didn't know that... I suppose you didn't know that what I'd find in this coffee if I took it down to have it analyzed, would you? Now, look, I don't want any trouble. I never had any. They'll tell you at headquarters. If it's a matter of dough... You can't buy your way out of this one, chum. I want talk, and I want it quick. What kind of talk? Where did you take Tommy last night? Oh, it was just a little party, a card party. Just uh, coffee and cake. Yeah, and they slip things in people's coffee there, too. I don't know anything about that, honest. I, I hardly know the people. Who's the guy with the frog voice? Voice? I don't know any guy with a frog voice. Ah, look, I don't want no trouble. They'll tell you at headquarters. Listen, there's a narcotics wrap on this for somebody, and it could be you. Come on, where was the party? Uh, Courtney Square West, number 75. Some people named Sorrell. Come on, Tommy, and you're going too, Joe, just in case. Sorrell, A.J. Does this look like the place, Tommy? Yeah, it looks like it. it. It could be. Everything's been so confused since last night. This is it. It better be. 
Mrs. Sorrell? Yes? I'm from police headquarters. Oh. Do you mind if we come in and look around? Oh, why, no. Come on, Tommy. You too, Joe. Oh, by the way, do you two know each other? He... Why, his face is familiar. I think he's been here a couple of times. We play a lot of cards. All kinds of people wander in and out. Is that what the trouble is? It might be. You know anyone with a foggy voice? No. Uh, not that I can remember. Okay, let's look at the apartment. Well, this is the hall, of course, and... And here's the living room. Joe, you stay here in the hall, and you better be here when I get back. Uh, I'll be here. So, this is the living room. Uh Uh-huh. This is the bedroom. Looks kind of messy now. See anything? No. Over here's the kitchenette. I see. That's about all there is to it. Denny, that closet. Oh. Oh, Oh, there's nothing in there. Just a lot of old odds and ends. Open it. Well, it's locked. All right, unlock it. I... I'm not sure where the key is. Then, lady, you'd better find it. Well, I'll try. Is this it, Tommy? There was a closet like that. And a window just over there where that one is. And the armchair and bed. Don't you remember? I can't, Danny. Let me have that key. Wait a minute. Here she comes. I think this is it. Try it. It sort of sticks sometimes. I'll help you. Uh, There it comes. See? Just a lot of old junk. Uh Uh-huh. Come on, Danny. You sure? Sure. Come on. Well, I guess that's all, Mrs. Sorrell. Thanks for showing us around. That's all right. Hello, Joe. Still here? Yeah. You, uh, don't mind if I stay here and visit a while, do you? No, I guess not. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks again. Goodbye. Good luck, copper. I'm sorry, Denny. Well, it was a try. What do we do now? I don't know, Tommy. We found Joe. Now what about those singing walls? Come on, think, Tommy, think! Yeah, yeah. That's right. It comes right out of the walls. We got hot and cold running water here. And singing walls. (laughs) Singing walls. (laughs) Jenny. Yeah? Listen. What? That's it. The singing walls. The music I heard last night. You sure? Sure. I remember the piece and the harmonica and everything. It's coming from around here someplace. Denny, it's coming from their apartment. The one we just left, Sorrell's. Come on. This must be the place, Tommy. The closet and now the music. They must have been pulling a fast one on us. Well? All right, quit stalling. Come on, Tommy. Stalling? Yes, you heard me. You two brushed us off pretty slick, didn't you? Listen, I don't know what this is all about, but... Where's that music coming from? Well, from the radio. The radio? Yeah. I turned it on the kitchen just now when I started to fix dinner. It's a little portable. In here. See? Uh, okay. I don't get it. What did you mean by... Oh, skip it, skip it. Well, Tommy, here we go again. I don't care. That was the music I heard. And that's the same number. Sounds like the same band. Hey, wait a minute. Now what? Where's your phone? On the desk. Denny, look and see what station that's coming over. It's uh, WBTA. Thanks. Hello, operator. Get me station WBTA, a radio station. I don't know what the number is. Tell him it's a police call. Yeah, it's a police call. Thanks. I may be wrong, Denny, but I got a hunch. Hello, WBTA? What's that band you've got on now? I don't care if it's an electrical transcription. What's the guy's name? What? Turn off that radio. Now, what was that name? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Well, where can you get a hold of this guy? Where does he hang out? Let's see. Five nights a week. That include tonight? Thanks. Well? He's a small town band leader. Harmonica Hal and his harmony, as he calls himself, and he plays at a place called the Silver Slipper out in the concourse. Come on. You better get on that phone, Joe. Ah, uh, you dumb. You would have to turn on that radio. <laughs> the silver slipper right over there. Okay, let us out here. Right. Yeah, here you are. Yeah, thank you, sir. It, uh, look familiar to you around here, Tommy? I'm afraid it's a bum steer, Denny. Look, kid, do you know what time it was when you heard the music? It was just night. That's all I know. All right. They don't play recording so much at night, particularly of small bands. And this silver slipper isn't on the air. So maybe you were out here someplace and you heard the band itself. Yeah, maybe. 
I know it's a kind of a long shot, kid, but right now it's the best we got. Let's case the joint. Okay. Hmm. Don't look like there were any rooms with closets in the silver slipper. Denny, look, right next to it. Yeah, a hotel. That would make sense. Yes, and the shape you were in, you probably would have signed your own name, too. Come on. Oh, by the way, what time you got? Ten to six. Ten to six. Our deadline's getting pretty close, kid. Yeah. This better be right. Oh, what a place. If I could only remember. Well, there's the clerk. We'll see, kid. We'll see. Say, lady, you got a guy named Tom Cochran here? Tom Cochran? I don't know. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. We're friends of his. I'll see. When did he register? Last night. Yeah. Oh, sure. Here he is. Tom Cochran and Ben Doyle. Yeah, yeah. Room 209. I don't think they're in, though. Oh, no? No. I've been ringing them to see if they were going to check out by 6. I was just going to send somebody up. Shall I ring again? No, no. We'll sort of surprise them. Okay. Right up those stairs. They got to be out by 6 or pay for another night. Yeah, well, we'll take care of it. Let's go, Tom. Denny, did you see the handwriting on that register? Yeah, yeah. It was mine, all right, Denny. This is it, Tommy, one way or another. Yeah. Here we are. Don't put your hand on that doorknob, kid. Fingerprints, use your handkerchief. Locked. I got some keys. It's an easy lock. Here we go, kid. Denny, this is it. Close that door. That's the closet. Give me your key. Here. Here, you better hold my gun on that door, just in case. All right. Denny, look out. <laughs> oh, he, he was just falling. He's dead. Oh, gee. This is... You remember now? Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a look at him. Stabbed. And here's his driver's license. Benjamin Doyle. Denny. Give me it. Hello? Yeah, we found him all right. No, they're going to keep the room for another night. No, there's not a thing we want. We're in for it now, kid. Denny, look. On the floor over there. A clasp knife covered with blood. That's what did it, all right? Yeah. Hey. I know. I know. It's mine. Tom, why didn't you tell me? Honest, Jenny. I didn't even remember I'd lost it until I saw it there just now. Fingerprints all over it. As clear as though they'd been made in sealing wax. Right-handed, aren't you, Tommy? Uh-huh. Let me see your right hand. Uh doesn't take an expert to read these. Those are your prints. All right, kid. Yeah, I guess they are. And you still don't remember? Honest, Danny, I don't. Can you think of any other explanation? No. There's the guy with the frog voice. I must have just dreamed him up. I don't know, I don't know. Well, kid? You did all you could, Danny. But don't feel bad. We can plead insanity or something. Maybe, maybe we can prove you were doped. Maybe. You better call headquarters, Denny. Let's let's get it over with. All right. Where are you going? I don't want to phone from here. That clerk will listen in. There's no use getting all the wolves on us before we have to. Aren't you afraid I'll... No, no. I won't. I'll just have him send a detective car, kid. You won't have to go in the wagon. Thanks. Oh, you better let me have my gun. Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll be back, kid. Lie down for a couple of minutes. You look kind of sick. I am. Oh. oh. That's the idea. Take a little snooze. I'll be right back. Hey, look at you. Blood. Blood all over your shirt. Him? Oh, he's all right. Put him in the closet. Yeah, lock the door. Key right in your pocket. Sure, I'll be right back. Be right back. Be right back. Here he is. You? Yeah, me. What are you going to do with him, Froggy? Get him in the other room until his copper friend misses him and starts looking. Uh, listen, I don't want to be in on anything like this. Shut up. You're in it up to your neck already. Come on, you. Come on, get up. Okay. And get going. Get going up the hall. Open the other door, Joe. Sure. 
Get in there. Let the guy, Frog? Yeah, Listen, yeah. Listen, Froggy, this don't look so good. There were people who knew you were getting ready to give it to Doyle. Sure, that's why I framed this guy. Oh, the trouble I went to. Doped him and brought Doyle in there while he was out. Planted the key on him, bloodied him up, put the knife in his hand. I still don't see how, how he ever come to in time. Yeah, but he did. So what? We frame him again. The music. Yeah. You like music, don't you? You're pretty sweet about music, eh? Huh? Well, for your information, that's harmonica hell rehearsing for the night. And in this room, it comes through the window. On account of the Rizzo window. But in the other room, it comes through the walls. On account of the rain, no window. Catch on. Better close the window, Joe. No, no, wait a minute. I, I do like music. You mind if a guy in a spot like I am hears a little music? What about it, Froggy? Sure, sure, sure. Leave it open. Leave it open. Let's have some music while we work. It'll cover up the noise if he makes any fuss. So, what's the new angle? Knock him off, dump him in the park. Dead by his own hands. Yeah. <laughs> Remorse. We leave the gun beside him and plant some of Doyle's stuff on him. I got it. All right, get going, get going. Tie him up. Put a handkerchief at his mouth and a coat, coat around him. He's sick, see? We're taking care of him. Okay. Where's the car? No, around you... the back. It's around the back. No, come on. Nobody will see us going out that way. You ready? Yeah. Take a look out the door. Okay. All clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's go, let's go. Lock the door after we go out. Okay. Down the hall to the back. All there. right. Hey, hey, what the... Uh... Got those guns and put them up. Cover them up, you guys. I got them. Hey, what is this? Uh, you'll find out, Graziani. Get the gag out of the kid's mouth and untie him, Mike. Yeah, sure. Oh, Denny. Yeah, kid, I heard the music. I hoped you would. I asked him to leave the window open. I heard the conversation, too. Enough. Okay, boys, okay. Take them down. Right, all come right, on. All right, come on, but you don't need to cut me. It's okay. Boy, who are they? Graziani's a mobster. Doyle was one of his boys who double-crossed him. How are you feeling, kid? Okay, I guess. It's kind of close. Yeah. All the way around. Yeah. Look, kid. Uh, oh, skip it. I'm... I'm sorry, Tommy. Honest, I am. I... I thought you did it. Denny, until just now, so did I. <laughs> And so closes The Singing Wall, starring Van Johnson. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. And now, further to intrigue you, we of Suspense present a special preview of our next exciting tale. And here it is, a tantalizing glimpse of our next adventure in Suspense. Huh? Que de nuevo? Que de nuevo, Johnny? Oh, sure. Sombrero. Yeah, check the sombrero. Good evening, Mr. Winston. You wish a table? No, thanks. No, I'm just browsing. Is uh, Ronaldo? Oh, no, there he is now. Oh, hello, Johnny. Hello. Hi, Ronaldo. Well, um, sit down. Have a little supper with me, huh? Oh, no, thanks. I, I'm not hungry. Well, come on, come on. Sit down anyway. All right. Anything to please you, sweetheart. Uh, tell me, how's business? Oh, fine. Great. Every time I get a bad break nowadays, Johnny, I get two good ones right after. <laughs> Say, when did you ever get a bad break? Well, you know Jackie, my little singer. Yeah, sure I know. Yeah, of course you do. Well, Jackie is quitting. Oh, that's too bad. And who do you suppose I'm getting? Just by the merest accident, who do you suppose I'm getting to take her place, huh? All right, I'll bite. Lorna Dean. Lorna Dean? Oh, you're kidding. No. <laughs> what do you think of that, huh? <laughs> Very good, huh? Well, if you'll excuse the aspersions, Ronaldo, I think, what does the dame with an international reputation like Lorna Dean want to be singing in a third-rate cabaret like this for? Oh, no, no, second-rate, maybe, but third-rate, no, no. All right, all right, second-rate. <laughs> but you can't pay her a tenth of what she's used to getting. And what she's, what is she doing down here in Buenos Aires anyway? Oh, now, what you want to ask a lot of questions for? She's going to sing. That's, that's good enough for me. Yeah, yeah, I guess it is. She's terrific, all right. Tell me, when does she start? Uh, two weeks from tonight. Why, uh, why did Jackie quit? It's kind of sudden, wasn't it? Oh, I don't know. She's, uh, nervous lately. She, uh, she wants to go back to the States, I guess. Oh. Say, uh, Johnny. Yeah? Uh, when are you going back? To the States? Uh-huh. Oh, six months, a year, two years, whenever this war is over. Don't you think you better, uh, 
Better go home maybe a little sooner, huh? Look, I don't want any lectures on my patriotism, if that's what you mean. Well, who's giving lectures? Down here we are, uh, <coughs> well, we are neutral. Yeah? Well, all right, that's what I am. The U.S. is okay, it's fine. It just happens that it never did so much for me that I feel like getting knocked off for it, that's all. Sure, sure, I don't want you to get knocked off. That's what I'm talking about. What are you talking about? Your health, Johnny. Do I take that two ways or only one? One. Listen, Johnny, listen. I see these things before. Sometimes fellows stay around these places so long they forget all about home. And then one day, finish. I pay my bills, don't I, eventually? Ah, Johnny, don't talk that way. It's only because I like you, you know. That. All right, all right. Cut it, cut it. Okay, okay. Ah, here comes Jackie now. <laughs> Alma. De la Africa lejana, yeah, na, mi pecho, mi. Uh, do, What's wrong? Uh, ay, ay, What's happening? Ay, right? Dios, ay. Hey, what, what's the matter? Hey, anyway. Come on, Ronaldo. Yes. I can't understand. She wasn't feeling well. Why didn't she tell me? She didn't have to go on. Coming through, please, please. Please stand back. Please stand back. Now. What's the matter here? This woman has been drugged, apparently. Uh, I am a doctor, sir. Oh! Uh, I, excuse, what is wrong? Please, I was in the please, please let me through. Mr. Ronaldo. I, uh, what do you want? I have no time now to... I want the job. Now. Job? Oh, it's you, Miss Dean. Couldn't you even wait until they looked the poor kid over before coming Did here? Did I ask you anything? Look, Mr. Ronaldo, I'm sorry for the girl, but I'm a singer, not a sob sister. I was going to start in two weeks anyway. I might as well start now. Well... All right, then, until Jackie can come back to finish out. Oh, but... yeah? It'll be about the longest run on record, then. Uh, what do you mean? This young lady is right, Senor Rinaldo. This girl is dead. Dead? Do you still want the job, Miss Dean? Yeah. I still want the job. <laughs> And so until our next performance, when you will hear the rest of this exciting tale, we keep you in... Suspense! This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Robert Montgomery. I have a new assignment, and I'm very happy about it. During these 60 minutes each Saturday, I'm to be acting spokesman for one of radio's really great entertainments, a program which is a prime favorite with all of us. You have come to know its opening music as the curtain raiser for radio's outstanding theater of thrills. 
you know it as a show which each week, for five years, has brought you first-class story material and exciting performances. You have come to recognize throughout the unique touch of our unique producer, my friend, Bill Spear. All of which can be said in one word. Suspense! An hour of suspense now. A full 60 minutes on Saturday night. And with the distinguished actor-director Robert Montgomery as your host. Tonight, Mr. Montgomery also appears as star in The Black Curtain, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. I don't have very much to say in the prologue department tonight. That's because at this premiere of the full-hour show, we're anxious to ring up our curtain, our black curtain, if you will, without unnecessary delay. Also, because tonight, I am appearing as an actor. The idea on most Saturday evenings is for me to make you welcome and chat about things you and I are mutually interested in. Crime, mostly. And the various types of criminal achievement, real and fictional. And the persons, actual and invented, who have committed those crimes and gotten themselves into those predicaments. And the people who have written about it and have compounded the particular brew of mystery and dangerous adventure which we serve up to you in the name of suspense. But tonight I am appearing for a good many of our 60 minutes as a man named Frank Townsend. Townsend will tell you his really amazing story in his own words. And so I think you will hear quite enough from him without hearing more from Robert Montgomery. And so if our producer, Bill Spear, is ready, we will ring up our curtain. Now, with the black curtain from the novel by Cornell Woolrich, and with the performance of Robert Montgomery, we hope once again to keep you in suspense. A man is born, he lives out his little life, and he dies. That's the one real break, I guess, that every man can count on. The one thing nobody can take away from him, to be born just once and to die just once. Every man, that is, except Frank Townsend. Born with no strikes on him, died with two strikes on him, and then was born again with three strikes on him. Pushed back into life that day on that street. <laughs> My head was pounding like the percussion instruments beating out the anvil chorus. I could hear all the noise and the people milling around. At first, everything was a jumble, sight and sound. Tall buildings, high sky, low faces, spinning and weaving and bells exploding. All right, now. Hey, watch all right. All right get moving now. Let the dark through. Oh, I seen it, officer. I seen it. He was running fast. The whammo clunk. He's growing like an onion with his head down and his feet up. All right. All right. All right. Break it up now, break it up. Oh, my head. Take, take it easy now, brother. Just lie still. Who? Uh, what are he now? I'm the doctor. Just lie still. I'll take hey, it easy. Hey, Copper! Yeah. Copper, his wallet fell out of his pocket. A guy grabbed him and right. he ran. All right, come on, get I back. I'll give him a little air. Get back. Please. I'm okay, Doc. I just sure, feel a little... Sure, sure, here. Yeah. Now, let me help you up. See if you can stand. Thanks. Thanks. I guess I can talk to him now, eh, Doc? Yeah, just a nasty bump on his head. He'll be okay. Huh. Now, here, let me brush your coat off, sir. Thanks, Doc. I... My coat. Hey, why am I wearing uh, an overcoat? Just over... for my report, mister, what's your name and address, huh? Uh, Townsend. Ah. Frank Townsend. Ah. 820 Rutherford Street. Uh, hey, a uh, cigarette, you're still a little woozy. You know. No, thanks, I don't smoke. Hey, well, look, uh, take a couple of aspirin. All right, right. all right, right. come oh, on, Mr. Hey, yeah, yeah. here's your hat, mister. Thanks, kid. Yeah, we'll see what we can do about the guy that snatched your wallet. Here's your cigar case. Mike, yes, but I haven't got it. Well, good luck, mister. I'm going to turn in my report. Cigar case? I don't smoke. Oh, it just fell out of your pocket when we lifted you. Yeah, but look at the initials on it. D.N. Yeah, same initials like in your hat, see? D.N. Oh, yeah. yeah, but that isn't my hat. Oh, you got a nasty crack on the noggin, mister, and... Well... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm trying to think. I... Where is this? Where is what? This. The street. This? This is Tillery Street. Tillery? What am I doing on Tillery Street? Hey, look, buddy. You sure you're okay? Well, what... What happened to me? I... Well, you were running. Uh, very dangerous running on this ice. Well, you slipped, hit your head, and was out for about 20 minutes. 
Ice? After that blizzard we had last night, did you expect Mayflowers? Blizzard? In July? I... July? Oh, listen, buddy, I got a flash for you. This is December, one week before Christmas, 1944. 1940? Oh, don't take it so hard. We all get older. You better get home and get a fast 40 winks. You need it. 1944. December, 1944. But the last I could remember was July, 1941. Three years, gone, just gone. A black curtain, the black curtain of amnesia comes down over your mind out of nowhere. That black curtain had been dropped over my eyes for three years. Where had I been? Who had I been? Not Frank Townsend. Someone else, D.N. Someone whose initials were D.N. I walked along Tillery Street thinking about it. Those three years, I, I could have been married, had a family, or could have been a thief, or... No, it was insane. 20 minutes ago, I left the little office where Johnny and I have our advertising business. I was on my way to speak to a client. 20 minutes ago, I told Johnny that... But that was July, 1941. There was no snow, no ice, no initials, DN. I must see Johnny. He'd know, he'd tell me. I stopped dead. I don't know why. Something made me turn my head. And that's when I first saw him. Gray eyes. He'd been talking to the cop who took my name. He looked after me as I turned my head. He started for me. I found myself backing away. Something about him screamed trouble. He quickened his step. You! Thompson! Stop! The sound of his voice sent terror roaring into my skull. I ran. He lunged after me. I saw him come as I rounded the corner, and in his hand he held a gun. He raised it. I ducked my head and ran for my life, for the second life that I'd been born into. <laughs> It was the ice that saved me. I flew across it, my toes barely touching its treacherous surface. But gray eyes slipped, spun through the air, gun flying from his fingers. By the time his heavy body had thudded to the ground, I'd hurled myself down the subway steps, walked, vaulted the turnstile, cheated the steel edge of the subway door as the train pulled out of the station. And for two hours, I rode the rails under the city. And for two hours, my stomach was gripped by terror. <laughs> dusk, and a new snowfall had settled over the city. I entered the sleek lobby of the Greystone building on 34th Street, where Johnny and I had our office. In a few minutes, I'd be sitting across the desk from Johnny, a good bottle between us, and then everything would be all right. Johnny would know what to do. He always knew, ever since we'd been in school together. He'd know how to find out who I'd been, what the initials DN meant, why Gray Eyes tried to kill me. An elevator door slid open, and I stepped into the cage. Floor, please. Ten. Pass, please. What? Your pass. I gotta see it. What pass? To go up to the tenth floor. Pass to... But I don't understand. My office is up Look, there. Look, and... buddy, all I do is run this elevator, not the country. Yes, but save I... Save it, save it. Guard! Two men came from the rear of the lobby. They were big men. They wore uniforms. The blue trousers tucked into brown puttees, their thumbs tucked into heavy belts that supported heavy guns and heavy clubs. White armbands read, SP. They eyed me with suspicion. Now, what's the trouble, mate? Tenth floor, no pass. Yeah. What's your business on the tenth floor, sir? Advertising. I mean, my office is there, and I... Are uh, you sure you're in the right building? Well, I... Uh, isn't this the Greystone building? You can't have no office in this building high on the fifth floor. But I tell you, we're my partner and me. We're on the... Nobody's on the 10th floor but the Navy. The Navy? All the way from the 6th to the roof. Why? You kidding, sir? Ain't you heard there's a war on? War? Look, mister, if this is supposed to be funny, you're in the wrong department. What's your name? Look, will you help me, please? My name is Townsend. I have an office here on the 10th floor advertising Townsend and Gale. Oh, yeah. Townsend and Gale. Well, that folded when the Navy took over. 
Where's Johnny Gale? He joined the Navy. Where can I find him? Oh, it'll be tough finding, mister. He was buried last month on Okinawa. Johnny, dead. Buried on Okinawa. The name meant nothing to me. Only that at Okinawa was buried my strongest link to my past. One slender thread leading back through the years remained. The apartment on Rutherford Street. I started to draw it in. Oh! Hello, Mrs. Hudson. Why, Mr. Townsend. I, uh, I guess I startled you. Why, no. No, not at all. I was expecting... I mean, I thought yeah, that you... Yeah, it's, it's been a long time. Not, not at all. I kept... I mean, I knew you'd come back, and... Well, your apartment is just where you left it. You kept the apartment for me, huh? After all, Mr. Townsend, you were my favorite tenant, and... Uh, come in. Come in. Thank you. You just go right on up, Mr. Townsend. I, uh, aren't you going to ask me what happened to me? Hi. You, you look very well, Mr. Townsend. I'm, I'm glad you're back. And, and... Yes, yes, I'm glad I'm... Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. <laughs> I started up the stairs, the same stairs, the same creaks, the same loose board halfway up. Everything the same, but everything unreal. Mrs. Hudson, unreal. I sensed her eyes following me up the stairs. I stopped, turned, looked down. She stared up at me, mouth slightly open. And for a long, long moment, neither of us spoke. Yes, Mr. Townsend? Mrs. Hudson. Uh... Yes, Mr. Townsend. Well, it's nothing, but you used to call me Frank. <laughs> Come all the way in, son. <laughs> He was sitting in the large chair by the window. In his left hand, he held a half-smoked cigar. It was pointed at the ceiling. In his right hand, he held a gun. It was pointed at me. It was gray eyes. Tillery Street. Just couldn't stay away from there, could you? Well, never fails. What do you want? There's some mistake. I... Given that harness bull the phony name with the right address. Very unbright. Listen, my name is Townsend. Frank Townsend. So, all right. So we'll bury you under that name. What difference does it make? Bury me? But why? Why? What have I done? Suppose you tell me. Maybe you can make it sound better. If I have to die, all right, I'll die. But I've got a right to know why, haven't I? Tell me what I've done. What am I dying Stand for? Stand still. Now, just give me one more excuse, son, and I'll kill you right here and right now. Yeah, that's better. I just settle back and relax. Now sit down over there. Lean back against the chair. All the way. Now put your hands on your head. And son, just pray that you don't get an itchy nose because if you even start to scratch it, it'll be the last itch you'll ever feel. Now, while we're waiting for the boys, we'll just sit and chat nice and friendly-like. Anything special you'd like to talk about? No? Okay, maybe I can suggest something. Maybe you'll find the loot an interesting topic of conversation. Sounds promising. The loot. What'd you do with it? 
I sat with my hands clasped to my head. I didn't dare move. He had the safety catch off. And I knew he'd send a bullet through my head without a second thought. That why you took the chance of going back to Tillery Street? Maybe the doll crossed you up, huh? Sure, you waited all week and she never showed. Maybe she'd Nothing, like it. he said, made any sense I to me. To right all I knew was that he expected others Please to arrive and they would take me. Where? His gray Maybe eyes went on and on, right his mind. voice droning, until I no longer cared what happened to things. me. Or why. It's good for your nerves. I think I was beginning to nod. It's not only good when for your When from the nerves, corner of my eye, I saw the door open slightly. I yeah. didn't stir. Gray eyes droned on. A man was standing in the doorway behind him. A small door. man with small hands. And he held a small right. finger up to his lips. His small feet so made quick, time. noiseless steps. He stopped silently There's behind so the chair in which Gray Eyes was sitting. Then he raised you know, a small gun and his small time, fist. <laughs> Gray Eyes emitted a small gasp and fell forward at my feet. I stared down at him stupidly. The small man <laughs> chuckled. Yeah, I am so small, and yet I have so much strength. It is revolting. You... I think you killed him. Uh, perhaps. So, you did not expect to see me, no? No. Uh, my friend, I did not observe you all these years for nothing. When the deed was done, I knew that your romantic American soul would eventually betray you. Yes, and so I said to myself, Dangler, I said, you must go to Tillery Street. Endure the cold and the wind, but watch, 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 and be patient while you watch. Yes, this I did. <laughs> and you see, my patience was rewarded. Dangler? Yes, my friend. Tell me, how, how bad are, th are things? My friend, I will tell you this. The situation for you is desperate, but not serious. I will guarantee safe conduct for you over the border to Mexico. But you must insist that I accept and press upon me when I refuse a fair share of the money. The money? Precisely. It, now, what would be fair? Well, in view of the difficult situation, we should share equally. Yes, 1,000 for me, 1,000 for you. And then you will give me the balance of 8,000 for expenses. Yes, for expenses. Give you 9,000. A truly fair and honorable distribution. Especially, my friend, when you consider that the 9,000 you give me is an item which is completely deductible. Yes, deductible from your income tax. I see. And suppose I refuse your offer. How can you refuse? Didn't I save your life by assaulting this, this thug from behind? And didn't I have the good sense to snatch your wallet when you so stupidly fell in the street? Yes. See? Here it is. <laughs> it was I who took it before the police could examine it. You have... Let me see it. Yeah, you may have it. Here, wait. What? Where's... Where's my cards, my identification? Where's his identification, he asks. I told you you were stupid. Would I dare walk about with your identification cards upon my person? Idiot! Uh, I begin to feel it is not safe to deal with you. All right, all right. I'll play ball. I begin to feel you have a little good sense. Now, where is the money? You think I carry it with me? Well, with a man like you, who knows? Very well, you must arrange to get it. I will be waiting for you at my office. Do not come there. Call me. Then we will contrive to meet. Is that clear? Yes. Good. Now, I shake your hand and wish you well. If you succeed in going out once more into Tillery Street and coming out safely with the money, I will be waiting for you. Hmm? And uh, if you do not come out, I will make a small novena for you. Hey, goodbye, my friend. Goodbye. <laughs> I shut off all process of thought and feeling. Reason was useless in an irrational world. Feeling dangerous in a dangerous one. I moved like an automaton, moving now from A to B, from B to C, from Rutherford Street to Tillery. Gray eyes and Dangler. Both had made Tillery Street their point of arrival and departure. And the point of my rebirth 
I took the chance that might rent the black curtain and let in the sun. Or rent my heart and let out my life. I returned to Tillery Street. can I do? Oh, hello, hello, how are you? You, uh, you know me. Well, why shouldn't I know you? I couldn't see you under that head at first. What can I do for you? Have you got an evening paper that I could look at? No, I'm sorry, I never read them. Too much trouble in the world these days, anyhow. How have you been? You haven't been around in two or three weeks. Yes, well, I've been busy. I Look, Pop, I, I made a bet with a guy that even though you see so many customers... You'll walk right up and give me my full name. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know it. I don't think I ever heard your name. Oh. But I know your girl. My girl? My girl? Oh, uh, you do? Yes. Well, now maybe I can still win my bet, huh? Of course. Ruth. Ruth. She lives right across the street. The Tillery Apartments. Well, that's right. Ruth. Ah. But now, what apartment? Apartment 3C, of course. Don't I take the sandwiches up there every night? 3C. Yes. yes. Well, thanks. Uh, will you win your bet, mister? What? Oh, yes, I think I will. I... Uh, what's your name so I'll know it next time? I'll tell you tomorrow. Oh, so long. So long, Pop. I'll be seeing... What's the matter? You dropped something? Nothing. Nothing. I... Just tying my shoe. What? I'd just been going to walk out when I saw him standing across the street. A man built like gray eyes, dressed like him. And I knew he was looking for me. I ducked down behind the store window and watched him. He looked over in my direction and then up and down the street. Lit a cigarette and then strolled down to the corner. The minute he disappeared, I yanked the door open, dashed out and ran across to the Tillery Apartments and went in. He may be in the neighborhood right now, for all you know. Who? Who? Well, Slattery, of course. Has he got gray eyes? What? Yeah, did you ever see a detective that didn't? Sure, sure, I but... Danny, what's the matter with you? You're acting so strangely. I, uh, I just wanted to look at you. You seem so different, so far away. You haven't kissed me. Well, that, that's easily fixed. <laughs> oh, darling, where have you been? All around. Miss me? You know I did. Oh, Danny, do you suppose... Do you think we could get away tonight? I've got ten thousand... Uh, some money saved up. We could go to Mexico or South America. We could get married. Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Nearing. Tour the world. Daniel Nearing. And wife. Sounds plenty good to me. You'll never know how good. We'll get out of here tonight. I'll call up and tell them I'm quitting my job. I'll say I'm sick. All my stuff's here. Nothing's out there but a couple of uniforms. <laughs> I'll make Ada and Franklin a present of those. Ada and Franklin? Are... Don't you bother your pretty head about those two. Maybe they weren't glad when it happened. A couple of vultures. Goodbye to them. Oh. Oh, with your back, Danny. Just think of the money I think, have. We can... Do you think you ought to have quit your job? I never was cut out to be a nurse. No, you weren't, were you? Any more than I was cut Any out... Any more to... than you were meant to be a secretary. That's right. I never wanted to be a secretary. I just drifted into it, I guess, and... It got on my nerves, especially towards the end, huh? The boss was no cinch to work for. He certainly wasn't. He was a rat. Oh, the whole Dietrich bunch are mean, rotten, the whole family. Yeah, that's right. I'll accept the old man. Oh, the old man. Yeah, I sort of liked him, didn't I? He loves you too, Danny. I think he wished you'd been his son. Poor old man. He's the only reason I've stuck around out there this long. How, uh, how are things out there? 
How could you expect them to be? Not very pleasant, huh? Oh, it's been great. Just great. Lots of questioning and keeping after me and me sick to my stomach with worry for you. Not knowing where you were, if you were alive or dead. Oh, Danny, Danny, it's been horrible. But you're back with me, and that's all that matters. I just want to forget everything. The Dietrichs, New Jericho. New, New Jericho, huh? Everything that happened. Like what? Oh, darling, please, let's not talk about it. We're the important thing now. I must know what's going to become of you. Because whatever it is, it means me, too. I don't know, Ruth. I don't know. I I saw Dingler today. Franklin's lawyer? Yeah. Where? I, uh, he passed me on the street. Did he see you? No. Are you sure he didn't? Are you, are you sure, darling? He, he didn't speak to me. Well, you know how clever he is. He just let you go by and, and, and follow you. Why? Why wouldn't he talk to me if he saw me? Well, he figures you're dangerous, darling. It wouldn't be safe for him to try it alone. Well, why am I dangerous? Well, whether it's true or not, darling, doesn't matter. It's what he believes that counts. And he believes like the rest of them. You know that. Yes. Yes, I guess I do. I... Danny, look at me. Oh, my dear. Your poor, tired eyes. Your face so strained. You need a shave, too. When did you sleep last? Sleep? I hadn't thought about it. I don't remember. That you can believe, Angel. I don't remember when I slept last. Danny, we must wait until the moon is down and we'll try to leave then. But now I want you to go in there and have a hot shower and a shave and then sleep for a while. You must, darling. You can't go on like this. I found my way to the bath without making a blunder, and the warm water felt good. I stood under the shower for a long, long time. It would have been pleasant to stand out the rest of my life just that way, under that soothing spray. In the medicine cabinet, I found a safety razor, shaving cream. I usually have trouble with a new razor. It takes me time to grow accustomed to it. But this one felt just fine. I slipped into my shirt and trousers and found my way to the bedroom. On a small tray near the bed, Ruth had placed a hot glass of milk and some toast. I was hungry. I ate. I slid between the sheets and they caressed my body with a gentleness that I hadn't known since childhood. Everything all right, darling? Right now, I... Here, let me tuck you in and open the window. The air's good for you. I'll leave the shade up. Don't turn the light on. The dark feels warm and friendly. Cigarette before you doze off? No, thanks. I don't... Sure. I like your eyes by matchlight, darling. They shine. No, don't blow it out. Let me. I'll make a wish. There. What was your wish? To be with you forever. Just to be with you like this. Feeling your dear face. Your chin, your jaw. Closing my eyes and still knowing you're here near me. This is all I want out of life. I wouldn't change places with any woman who knows and is sure she has her man forever. Who knows no one might come at any minute to take him from. You're all I want, Danny. Forever. Now and forever. Because for us, darling, forever is now. And then I slept. And yet I didn't sleep. The dream held more reality than the bed I was in. The dream held no distortions, no goblin shapes, no complete persons at all. Nothing in it but a pair of feet and a patch of pavement just large enough to contain them. They kept moving forward toward me, towards my eyes, and the pavement kept slipping past beneath them like a treadmill going the other way. 
It was as though I were moving backwards, away from the feet, and they kept moving toward me, coming toward me, toes pointed straight at me, remorseless and inevitable. That simple pair of black shod feet, never at a run, always at the same, even implacable, persistent walk. The cushioned thud of their incessant fall on the pavement, the rhythm of the walk. Pat, 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 pat. The echoing night sound when streets are still with someone coming towards you in the distance. It was as though the feet knew they needn't hurry for nothing. No one could escape them. And then slowly they began to gain on me, closer and closer to my eyes. There was no escape. To turn aside and let them go by was impossible. The crevice between the sole and the pavement opening and closing like a hungry mouth, grazing, threatening to trap and crush and trample me. And that's when I gasped from there and jumped from the bed. sweat poured down my legs and back. I was stifling. The darkness in the room lay over my head like a blanket. It seemed to shut out the air. Still gripped by the terror of the dream, I threw on the light, leaned out of the window, and sucked in huge gulps of cold, clean air. Danny! Huh? Danny, get away from that window! Ruth, I just saw he's down there. That man, like gray eyes. Put out the light! I must see if... He's standing in front of the hydrant. He's coming in here, in the building. Did he see you? Ruth, I need... Will you help me? What are you going to do? Go down and face it. I can't no, stand it. No, 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 you can't. It's better than waiting for it here no, like darling, this. No, darling, no, no. You haven't got a chance. They'll send you to the chair. The chair? Well, what did you think happens to a man when he's guilty of murder? Murder? Ruth, listen to me. I'm not a murderer. If the whole world says I committed murder, I say I didn't. The me that's in me says I didn't. I never said you were, Danny. I always said you didn't do it. But they found the body and they... Oh, if only you hadn't run away. So that's it. You shouldn't have done it. Why did you come here, Danny? Why? Why? Ruth, quick. We've got to get out of here. How about the fire escape, the shaft, the dumbwaiter? The dumbwaiter? Oh, Lock here. that kitchen door. I'll stand on top and work the ropes. I don't think it can hold us both. It's got to. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, Danny. Danny, what do we do? We're going back there to New Jericho. New Jericho. Oh, no, Danny, don't. Please, for me, don't do it. I've got to. I've got no. to find out. We're going together. No. No, Danny. No, I've got the money. We can get out of here. Stop we can... it. Stop it. Stop it, Danny. You're hurting me. From here on in, we're sticking together. You're going to take me back there. Back where it happened. All right, darling, all right. It's crazy, but... I'll go wherever you go. I can't lose you again. In tonight's full hour of suspense, Robert Montgomery, our star, appears as Frank Townsend, with Eureen Tuttle playing opposite him as Ruth Dillon in William Spears' production of The Black Curtain by Cornell Woolrich. Tonight's study in suspense. In just a moment, we will return with Act Two of The Black Curtain. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Robert Montgomery as Frank Townsend, alias Danny Nearing and Doreen Tuttle as Ruth Dillon in Act Two of The Black Curtain, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. On the train, Ruth and I said very little to each other. While I'd hid in the phone booth at the Penn Station, she'd bought us a couple of cheap raincoats. And I sat hunched up in mine, thinking, yet not daring to think. Ruth had brought along the newspaper clippings. I read them for the 20th time. They all read alike. Dietrich Slayer saw it. Secretary wanted in brutal slaying at suburban estate. Police are pressing the search for Daniel Nearing, secretary in the employ of the late John Dietrich, 58. 
member of a well-known local family who was shot and killed in the drawing room of his New Jericho estate on the morning of December 15th. The wall safe was robbed of $10,000. Nearing disappeared December 15th, on the morning of which date he is known to have had a bitter quarrel with the deceased. This last was attested to at the inquest by Ada and Franklin Dietrich, widow and brother of the murdered man. I had all the facts now, wanted for murder. And yet everything that was in me told me that no matter who I had been, however many memories I had lost, that I was no killer, that I just couldn't have... I had to get into the Dietrich house and stand again in that room where it all had happened. Maybe something would come back to me. Maybe there would be... Cab stand. Oh, stranger. <coughs> oh, it's cold. It's bad night. <coughs> Trains lead all up and down the line. Well, this time of year, yeah, you know. Gotta expect it, as the fellow says. Uh, just going home, Miss Dillon, for a shivery. Give you a lift out to Dietrich House. No, no, thank you. Uh, they're sending the station wagon for me. Mm. Nasty night to wait. Oh, I don't mind. Really, I don't. Uh, See, see where that Nearin fella, or Townsend, or whatever he calls himself now. Townsend? Yeah, uh, he was hiding out in the city on Rutherford Street under the name Townsend. City detective caught up with him, and this Nearin, he uh, fractured his skull. Oh. Yeah, uh, bad actor, that fella. Always thought so. Well, detectives in the hospital don't expect him to live, says here in the paper. City police have orders to shoot to kill. Oh, uh, no. Shoot to kill. Only thing to do with a mad dog, shoot to kill. Uh, hey there. You all right, Miss Dillon? Oh, yes. I, I, I'm just feeling... Uh, I'm all right. Well, uh, are you sure you don't want me to... No, no, I'm fine, Miss Drapel. I'm fine. You go ahead. I'll wait for the Dietrichs in the station. Well, shoot yourself, I always say. Uh, good night, Miss Dillon. Uh, 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 Merry Christmas. Uh, good night, Miss Drapel. Listen, Ruth, what he said just now, I didn't attack that detective. It doesn't matter, darling, it doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters more than anything else in the whole world because now I'm a mad killer and I didn't attack or kill anyone, not anyone. It was Dengler. He hit that detective oh, with... Oh, Danny, who would believe you? Franklin's lawyer, a man weighing less, and, and... You've got to believe me. If you don't believe me about this, then you must believe that I killed Dietrich, too. All I know is that I love you. Quick! Oh, in the bushes! See them? Who was it? It was Aiden Franklin in the station wagon. Then the house will be safe for us. There's no one there. No, no one for a while. Except the old man. Maybe he's out too. Oh, Danny, that's a cruel joke. You know how he feels about you. Yes, but it seems that everything I say is a cruel joke, whether I know it or not. Let's go. Door, Ruth. Hurry. I've got to see the inside. That room, the place where it happened. It's wrong, Danny. It's wrong. I'm telling you, you're crazy. They'll find you. Open the door, Ruth, quick. All right, now. Let's have a look at the room. Please, Danny, please. Don't, don't, don't talk about it. So this is where I'm supposed to have murdered John Dietrich. Danny, please. Where was it? Show me exactly where it was, Ruth. I've got to know. It, 
It was there. Right there. He, he was standing by the grandfather's clock. Are you going crazy, Danny? If they get you, you'll hang. With the clock. You still believe me, don't you, Ruth? I believe you, Daddy, but I'm scared. And I love you. Ruth. What's that? Listen. Oh, that's only the old man. He's asleep in that room off there. Don't go in there, Danny. Don't, please. You'll wake him. I want to see him. Don't, Danny. He can't help you. Turn on the light. I want to see him. I looked at him, lying there. The old man. The old man who was supposed to love me like a son. The old man who breathed and ate and suffered, but did not live. Inert, shaped in the likeness of a human form that might have been molded out of pink dough. Cheeks sunken, limbs withered, sucking air greedily through lips that were distorted old. The old man stared up at me from his bed. Every nerve, every muscle in his body were paralyzed. He could neither talk nor move. He was doomed to endless days of seeing and hearing, filled with the secrets of others, the secrets he was forced to carry to the grave with him. And this was the old man on whom I had planned my last hopes. <laughs> There, you woke him. It's me, Mr. Dietrich. Ruth. This is Danny. You remember Danny, don't you? Hello, Mr. Dietrich. See how his eyes are shining. Yeah. Was he here when it happened? You know that, Danny. Why do you ask such funny questions? He's been in bed here for five years. That mirror. On the wall there. The clock. Look, you can see the grandfather's clock in the other room. What are you getting at, Danny? He could see it. The old man could see the murder through the mirror. If he could only talk. But he can't talk. You scare me, Danny. He saw the man who killed John Dietrich. Look, he understands what I'm saying. He's blinking his eyes. Oh, stop torturing him, Danny. Can't you see what you're doing to he's him? He's trying to say something. Look, his eyes are blinking. He's, he's going to help me. Go outside and watch, Ruth. Go on. I'll watch out of the entranceway. Be careful, Danny. They'll be back any minute. Leave me alone with him. I'll call if I hear them coming. Yeah. Look, now, Mr. Dietrich, don't be afraid. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to answer me. Are you going to tell me something about the murder? Now blink your eyes. Blink twice if you are. That's it. That's it. Once, twice. That's good. Did you see it happen here in your mirror? Blink once if the answer is no. Twice if the answer is yes. Once. Twice. You did, huh? You saw it. Now then, is the murderer in this house? Danny, Danny, they're coming. Franklin and Ada. Get out of here. Hide! Run, Danny. Run, run! The murderer in this house. Blink once for no, twice for yes. Yes. Danny! Danny, they're coming! Wait, I've almost got it, Mr. Dietrich. Mr. Dietrich, was it me? Oh, Danny, once for come me, on, once come for no, on. twice for yes, was it me? Get out of here, Danny, please. In the big room behind the curtains. I'll talk to them. They're here. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Dietrich. I'll be right back. Oh, oh Ruth? Ruth, is that you in Father's room? Yes, Mrs. Dietrich. Oh. You here alone? Well, yes, I am. Why? We thought we heard voices. What are you so jittery about, Ruth? I'm just tired, that's all. May I go to bed now? Oh, is Father still awake, Ruth? Well, he'll go to sleep all right. He's... I'm going upstairs, Mrs. Dietrich, now. All right, good night, Ruth. Good night. Good night. She's brought someone back here with her. It's him, I think. Who? Dan? Oh, frankly... Take it easy. If he's here, we'll get him. To the evidence we gave against him at the hearing. Franklin, I'm scared. Let's get out of here fast. I'll, I'll go to the village with the police. Call the police. I'll do it. Yes. yes, yes. Hello. Hello. Oh, too late. It's dead. The wire's cut. Come on, we'll both drive to the village. No, no. He, he may be waiting for us out of the car, <clears throat> Franklin. You... Huh? What? What do you mean? Oh. Uh. Of. Uh, what are you doing there, Franklin? I, uh. I think I just might need my gun. Well, let's be on our way. Now, Mr. Dietrich, you're helping me fine. You know I'm trying to save my life, don't you? Now, the murderer, was it me? Was it me who did it? Me, Danny Nearing. Blink once for no. Once. Once! You're sure? You're sure it wasn't me? 
You're smiling, Mr. Dietrich. You're smiling. Now, was it somebody in this house? Then who was it? Can't you make a sound? Help me. You've got to. Was it Ada? Twice for yes, once for no. Once. Not Ada. All right. Then was it Franklin? Was it... Up for the hands, Nearing. Up or you'll never go to trial. Franklin, you've got to listen. You've got to... Shut up and drop that flashlight. Trying to kill the old man, too, huh? The murderer returns to the scene of his crime. You know I didn't kill him. Tell that to the police. Ada will have him here in a couple of minutes. Where's your girlfriend, Ruth? She's not here. I don't know where she went. Never mind. They'll find her. You're a dead duck, Nearing. Killed my brother and beat him. What did you get out of it? That, that's always puzzled. You me. killed your brother and now you're going to kill me. Well, you've gone nuts, too. Why should I kill my own brother, you idiot? To get his share of the estate and his wife, Ada, among other things. But you can't stop with killing me. Someone else knows the truth. The old man saw it in the mirror. You'll have to kill your own father, too. The old man saw it? He How do you told know? me. He told me. You're lying. He can't talk. He can't even move. He can hear and he can blink his eyes. Come over here and look. Look here. I want... Oh, Ruth! I had to do it, Danny. I heard him. He was going to kill you. Here's his gun, Danny. Take it. But, Ruth, you shouldn't have been another minute. I'm not sure it was Franklin. Then, darling, please, let's run for it. They'll be here in a second. It's your last chance. They'll all swear you did it. Not if I can be with the old man another half a minute. Mr. Dietrich. Mr. Dietrich, it's no, Danny, Danny again. No, Danny, don't, don't, Tell me, please. Mr. Dietrich, was it Franklin? Did Franklin kill your son, John? Blink once if he did. What's the matter, Mr. Dietrich? Don't be afraid. I won't hurt you. Why are you afraid? He's afraid, Ruth. Oh, it's this gun. Take the gun, Ruth. You take it. He's afraid. I'm not going to hurt you, Mr. Dietrich. What's the matter? Why don't you answer me? Who killed John Dietrich? It wasn't me. It wasn't Ada. It wasn't Franklin. But someone in this house, was it? Ruth. Ruth. You. I told you. I told you not to come. Oh, I love you, Danny. And I wanted you. I wouldn't have let them get you. Why, Ruth? Why? Why did you kill John Dietrich? He was always after me. He wouldn't leave me alone. And I hated him. And then that night he came at me. He threatened me, said he'd kill me. If he couldn't have me, nobody could. He had a gun, Danny. And I, I got it away from him. It, he hit the clock. He leaned against it. I thought he'd never fall down and, and die. I took the money to make it look like robbery. It was the day you ran away. I, I was crazy, I know. And, and, and they thought it was you. And they started looking. You. Why was it you? I love you, Danny. I love you. I begged you not to come back here. Ruth, put that gun down. No. Don't come near me, Danny. I just want to look at you. Just once more. I was hoping we could get away together. But you've been through enough because of me. All right, open up. Open up. And now you're clear, Danny. And this is going to clear me. Forever. My darling. Ruth, no, they'll kill you. about all there is to tell, I guess. Ruth faced that door, fired a shot into the ceiling, and the guns of the police chopped her down. That's the way she wanted it, I guess. It was gray eyes, bandaged head and all. But what's the use of talking about it? I'm trying to put it all behind me, resume my life where it left off three years ago. Sometimes when it gets toward evening, I walk along Tillery Street, and once in a while, somebody, somebody I don't know, will say, hello, Danny. And I, well, I just say, hello, and walk on. I don't want to find out anything anymore. I want it all to die away and be still. And it will, all except Ruth, because somewhere behind that black curtain, I was loved and loved someone. 
we must have known a love that I'll never know again. So closes the Black Curtain, tonight's tale of Suspense. In a moment, the spokesman of Suspense and tonight's star, Robert Montgomery, will be back. For the benefit of latecomers among our audience, may we say that Suspense is now being heard as a full-hour program on Saturday nights at this hour, 8 to 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Suspense, as always, is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Our musical director and conductor is Lud Gluskin. The composer of our original scores is Lucian Morawieck. Lorraine Tuttle appeared opposite Mr. Montgomery as Ruth Dillon, and you heard performances by Kathy Lewis, Janet Nolan, Sidney Miller, Conrad Binion, Jack Crucian, Bill Conrad, Jerry Hausner, Paul Fries, Ira Grissel, Junius Matthews, Harry Lang, and Joseph Kearns. This is Bill Spear, twice as much as out of breath as usual after our first hour production of Suspense. I certainly want to thank everyone connected with our adventure this evening, and naturally it begins with Mr. Montgomery. Bob, this is going to be truly wonderful working with you. Thank you, Bill. We didn't have much more time, and I, we don't have much more time, and I think all of us are about ready to wrap up and go home. In the next weeks of suspense, we plan to bring you the very best of novels and plays, stories by such acknowledged masters and mistresses in the art of suspense as Mary Bellock Lowndes, Dashiell Hammett, Agatha Christie, Eric Ambler, John Buchan, James M. Kane, Graham Greene, Raymond Chandler, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and last but by no means least, Mr. William Shakespeare. Mr. Spear and I, and all of us, would be tremendously interested to know what you think about the new Saturday night full hour of suspense. Any suggestions and comments that you may have will certainly be valuable to us. We hope that from now on you will want to set this hour aside each week and leave the door of your radio ajar for us. See you next Saturday. Robert Montgomery is currently being seen in the Universal International production, Ride the Pink Horse. Don't forget, next Saturday, 8 to 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, another 60 minutes of... Suspense! This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.